Hey, Owen, are you there? Hi, Mike. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm uh, just working with uh, Cable Ace. Hey, Owen, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, can you promote me to co-host? Hey, Mike. How are you? Uh, hey, how are you doing? Sure. Good, thank you. I'm just working with uh, Cable Ace. Hey, Owen, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, can you promote me to co-host? Hi, Mike, can you, um, did you receive that co-host invitation? Did it go via email? No, I just promoted you within the meeting here. So you are a co-host. I can make you the host if you wish. I should be all set. Okay. And we're also going live on Cable 8 right now. We're just working the last few details out on that. I figured while you were doing that, I can uh, let people in as panelists arrive. Greetings, all. Hello. Hey, Mike. I think it was you who gave me the promotion, so thanks. No problem. You may not thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. But uh, it was a little strange. I didn't quite have the right um, invitation, so I'm not quite sure where things went awry. But anyway, here we are. Mike, it looks like there are already um, two questions. Robert Herbserber is saying there's no password on the meeting. Not a good thing for publicly advertised meeting, but um, let me just see if I can find that. What is? We're in webinar mode, so that shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, so bizarre because I got in without you know using my Yahoo anyways I think to Jeff's point the only people allowed to speak will be the panelists and then when we open it up um, we have control over um, over the attendees and and whether they can speak or share anything so um, that's sort of the difference between just sort of a blanket zoom meeting Well, the good news is I think we're going to set a record for attendance at one of these. This is great. Wow, I, I'm psyched, kind of. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Just to let you know, we are now live on Cable A TV also. Wow, 72 so far.
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a few more minutes um, just to make sure we've got um, everybody before we get started. Sorry, Owen, um, you may not have seen my other email, but uh, not all of these uh, are going to be speakers tonight. So I'm just, I was putting a few people back in the attendee participant. Okay, that's quite okay. I'm just gonna be here on the side if you need anything. Thanks. Jeff, uh, what about Christine? Our yeah, she's um, having trouble getting on right now. Okay. Let me go check, okay? Sure thing. Thank you all for bearing with us while we get this uh, coordinated. Um, just a few technical issues. Just want to make sure we get it all lined up before we get started. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, looks like we've got a great crowd here. This is awesome. Good evening, Michael. Um, Owen here. I believe everyone is present now. We've got Christine squared away. She is good to go. Yeah, we just need Jeff back. Okay. All right. Um, I think, um, Larry, just want to make sure you're good to go when you put with your presentation. Pam, do you want me to drive from here and just uh, push things as you guys say next? Yes, please. Okay. Give me a minute then to get that teed up. Okay. Uh, okay. If you're ready, I will start sharing. Or why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and then I'll share. All right. Well, um, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, this is um, truly a momentous occasion. Uh, this is quite honestly the most uh, participation we've ever had in some of our uh, capital building projects. And I think it's uh, great. Obviously, it shows that um, people are really concerned about this and we're here to tonight to um, share some information with those who are new to the project and to really hear from you um, on how you think uh, things should proceed and what you're concerned about, what your questions are on the project. Um, we may not have all the answers tonight. I think uh, answers are sometimes hard to come by these days and uncertain times. Um, we will certainly work hard to get any answers uh, out there that we can. And um, but we really want to hear what uh, you all are concerned about and what your thoughts are on the project. 
and um, give us some feedback. And then we'll uh, evaluate all of that and discuss how we move forward. So um, tonight you're gonna hear from a, a group which I'll do some brief introductions on. Um, and then I'm going to pass it off to um, Anna May, who will have also some brief opening remarks. My name is Mike Quinlan, and I am chair of the School Building Committee. I um, practice as an, what's called an owner's project manager in my professional life and manage uh, these types of projects um, as well. We also have our, our owner's project manager that we hired for the town, uh, Left Field, who is represented by Lynn Stapleton and Tim Baker here tonight, um, and Gina Gomes Cruz as well. Um, you'll also hear from our um, superintendent, Jeff Marsden. Dr. Marsden uh, will be uh, speaking tonight a little bit about the project on his project update, as well as I mentioned, Anna Mayo Shabrook, who uh, is a member of both the school committee as chairwoman and also a member of the school building committee. Um, we also have uh, Christine Power from the school district, and um, I, Christine, I apologize if I forget the actual title, but it was a director of instruction on... and innovation. Thank, thank you, instruction <laughs> and innovation. And then, lastly, we have um, uh, the architects that we've hired for the project. Uh, is a company called Arrow Street, um, and uh, it is led by Larry Spang who will spearhead the presentation and um, his project manager, Tina Suhu. So um, that's what you'll be hearing tonight. Again, just what we're here to do is really to uh, give you an update on where we stand with the project and hear feedback from you. Um, and then we'll follow, we'll talk about next steps as we get to the end of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Anna May. Thank you, Michael. Um, I want to. I'm I'm overwhelmed at the participants right now, and I know that folks are also watching on Midfield TV. So thank you very much, and welcome everyone. Um, there are really just three things that I'd like to emphasize at this point. Um, firstly, that the school committee and school leadership are completely focused on a safe re-entry for both students and staff in the fall. So I, I definitely wanted to reiterate that. And number two, um, we're also incredibly sensitive to these uncertain times that Mike had spoken about and I'm sure we'll refer to in, in later in the presentation, but the world is a different place um, than three months ago or even in the last 24 hours here in Medfield. So we're attuned to that. And um, again, we are very sensitive to that. And thirdly, um, again, to reiterate what Mike said, um, we're here for feedback tonight and during the forthcoming months. We want to be compassionate listeners and we welcome and want your feedback. And um, later in the presentation, um, someone will explain all the various opportunities. And uh, with that, again, thank you. And I will pass this on now to um, Larry. Can't hear you, Larry. Yeah, we start slow, don't I? <laughs> okay, hang on for a minute. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, Owen, it looks like I'll need to get uh, permission to share my screen. Okay, Larry, right. do you mind trying that now? Yeah, let's try it again. Uh, hang on. There we go. All right. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Um, so let me just confirm that folks can see the title page of the presentation. OK. Yes. And then, uh, Mike, I believe you were going to do the first couple of pages. So let me jump to, oh, hang on for a minute. There we go. Uh, the agenda and I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Yep. So, um, so here's our agenda for this uh, presentation. We're gonna try to keep it to half an hour. I know that uh, it's a, a little challenging because there's a lot to digest. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for questions and discussion. Just as sort of a, 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 an approach to this, what we're going to do is take questions one at a time 
Um, we're going to try to get to everybody that has questions. Um, so I would ask that you hold your questions till the end. Um, so we make sure that we're taking questions um, from each individual in, in order. Um, and, and please try to keep and your questions to one at a time, not three or four. We want to make sure that we uh, reach as many people as possible. Um, so with that, uh, just for the agenda tonight, we're going to walk through a quick background on how, how we got here, um, quick timeline. We're going to talk about some of the existing conditions that led to the start of this project. Um, and then we're going to focus um, a good amount of time on um, some decisions that have been pressing in, in, as, as we entered uh, this phase a couple of weeks ago and um, maybe two months ago, um, which is grade configuration and, and how that impacts educational planning. Um, so there's going to be a lot of new information there for a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, we're going to talk uh, very briefly about site selection. Um, we're happy to take questions on it, um, but there will be future meetings regarding that. Um, and then some quick uh, design alternatives that uh, Arrow Street has pulled together. We'll talk about some next steps, um, what we're thinking right now, but again, our plan can adapt as we uh, hear from the community. So that's going to be an important place. Um, between six and seven, between next steps and where are we going. And then we're going to open it up to questions and discussion, which uh, again, I'm going to take one at a time. Please type it into the Q&A section. Um, and then if I um, get a chance and we need to talk about it in person, what I'll do is I'll allow each person to talk um, so that they can be heard. Uh, so we don't have to go back and forth necessarily via text. So, all right, with that, um, next slide, Larry. So I'm going to just walk you through a little bit of this and then I'm going to hand it back to Larry, but um, basically this just gives you sort of a quick timeline of Dale Street School, originally built in 1941 um, with a, a, a very beautiful addition obviously put on in 1960 and that was for the cafeteria uh, and classrooms uh, towards the back side of the site. Um, in 1997, um, part of the building had been used for the central office that was moved back to uh, town hall. So there was some minor renovations and window replacement occurred. And then in uh, 2000, there were some uh, modular classrooms added that probably are, were not planned to be there that as long as they have been, but they, those are just to the, to the north of the uh, 1969 edition closest to the uh, baseball field. Next slide, Larry. Um, the, the project was identified as something that needed to be considered as far back as 2008, as far as we can see. Um, it was before my time here, and I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, before that. But so it's been identified for over 12 years as something that needed to be considered. Uh, in 2009, there was a feasibility study performed and over the years, as we uh, worked through our capital plan and through other capital projects, such as the DPW and the public safety building and address those needs, um, Dale Street became next on the radar. Dale Street's a little bit different in that it's an MSBA project. For those who don't know what that means, it's the Massachusetts School Building Authority. And what they do is they participate and fund, help to fund um, school building projects throughout the Commonwealth. They are funded by one cent on the um, sales tax. So every time you buy something, you're contributing one cent of that tax per dollar to, um, um, to schools. Um, so the uh, project basically applied for, um, fun, uh, for entrance into the MSBA program. And the MSBA, when they get an application, which is known as a statement of interest, um, they sometimes, if they evaluate that statement of interest and feel it's worth exploring further, they come out and do a survey, which they did, um, and identified the Dale Street School as being in, in very poor, uh, the poorest possible building condition that they typically rate. Um, so, um, and that basically started the process. And um, in 2017, there was a capital assessment conducted, the statement of interest filed with the MSBA. And, and subsequently, we were invited to what's known as the eligibility period. And this is where we basically enter the MSBA program. And 
And then um, the eligibility period really just has to do with making sure all our paperwork is in order. Um, and then we build a team, um, which is hiring an owner's project manager, left field, and an architect in um, Arrow Street. Uh, we subsequently, that those were all accomplished in uh, 2019. Um, and then so over from the end of 2019 to today, we've been working from December through January on um, documenting the existing conditions, which the MSBA requires us to do. Um, we've had some public forum, certainly none that have uh, as many attendees as tonight. This is certainly um, a record for us, and I'm so glad to see that everybody's interested. Um, and then um, in March, we submitted what's called the preliminary design program to the MSBA. The pre preliminary design program is a very extensive document, which basically outlines the problem. It outlines what the challenges are with the school, why an, a project would be needed. And then um, we subsequently move into the phase we're in now, which is called um, the PSR or preferred schematic report, where we start to try to solve those problems. So um, that's probably more than I should have gone into and in trying to be brief. So um, I will pass it back to you, Larry. Thanks, Mike. Um, and just to point out again, uh, for those who can see, and I'll try to wave the, my cursor over, this was the original building built in 1941 with the gymnasium portion in this portion, the link connector, and then the classrooms in this two-story building. And then in back, as Mike mentioned, the 1969 edition, which is the cafeteria surrounded by classrooms. Um, we've done a pretty uh, substantial review of the existing conditions of the building. Um, and those were, as Mike mentioned, documented in the PDP. Uh, that was a several hundred page uh, report that is available for those of you who wanna um, plow through it. Um, it's available on the town's website. Um, but we look at two things when we look at the existing building. One is um, how well does it respond to the educational needs of the school? And then secondly, um, and the ones you might be more familiar with is what is the condition of the building itself? So we wanted to highlight both sets of issues and this is uh, by no means um, the full li list. Again, those are in the um, uh, full report. Um, the projected enrollments, um, there's um, as currently uh, configured, there's not enough classrooms to meet projected enrollment growth. Um, and the classrooms are undersized and particularly for how teaching is evolved um, and the ability to provide flexible approach to teaching. Um, the classrooms are definitely on the small side um, as well as there really is a need for differentiated learning and special education spaces. Again, the way education is delivered to students, it's very much trying to reach out to them on a as needed or one-on-one -on -one basis, small group um, and so forth. And so the building has um, a number of deficits in that area. Um, there's also simply a lack of space. Um, as you can see in the lower right, um, education is happening in hallways, corridors and other makeshift spaces. Um, the way the original 1969 wing was constructed. You can see in the upper photo, the cafeteria is in the middle of the classroom. So there's really no acoustical separation. Uh, when there's kids in the cafeteria, the classrooms can be impacted and um, you have to sort of march through the cafeteria to get to the media center. And really um, space for specials, the arts and music programs is really lacking uh, compared to what the district needs. So those are sort of the educational deficiencies uh, we very much want to pay attention to those because oftentimes those are a little harder to solve than the actual, <clears throat> excuse me, building can deficiencies. And again, here is a, uh, a small list of the major elements. Um, we have gone through it with our engineers. Um, as you can imagine, based on the age of the building, there's a number of exterior repairs that need to happen. Um, but more importantly, um, things like poor Thermal performance are very hard to solve in a building. Um, the heating and cooling systems are obsolete. You can see the lower right, that's what's called the unit ventilator in the classrooms. Um, that's a noisy um, piece of machinery that doesn't do a great job with heating and cooling. The electrical system is undersized. Um, the building was really not built to provide full accessibility the way we expect. There is not an elevator to the upper floor. 
and the toilet rooms don't have the accessible needs that uh, they should. Interior finishes worn in poor condition um, and other deficiencies, essentially <clears throat> creating maintenance and operating issues that are gonna continue to, um, uh, the town will have to continue to deal with if the building is not um, substantially renovated or replaced. So with that, um, Jeff and uh, are gonna talk about the educational planning issues. Thanks, Larry. Yep. <clears throat> so I guess one of the most um, important and exciting parts so far on this project has been going through the educational programming and visioning sessions that we had that started in December and concluded in February. So two of those sessions were um, open to the public and three of those sessions uh, were working group se uh, sessions where we had over 30 people uh, part of that. So we had parents, teachers, uh, community members, uh, town officials, Selectman Murphy was a participant, uh, Mike Pastore, the chair of the Warren Committee was a participant. And we really looked at um, trying to gain, you know, three main outcomes through these, through these sessions. We wanted to develop a list of priorities for the project. So things like safety, uh, fiscal responsibility, community access. We wanted to also look at the future ready learning goal. Learning goal. So critical thinking, citizenship, uh, teaming collaboration, those are really important things to us. And that came out of these, these visioning uh, sessions. And then we got into the design patterns where we got to see things that were really important to the community like maker spaces, uh, sustainability and flexible learning environments, outdoor gardens, all those came out of those, those sessions. It was really powerful to get that many people in the community as part of this process. Um, the last uh, community vision workshop really culminated with, and you'll see in the lower right-hand corner of that picture, where we got to um, design two and three dimensional models of what a school could look like um, if we build a new school. So that was a really powerful um, exercise, a lot of hours, a lot of volunteer hours there for folks involved in that. So that was really um, a powerful, um, powerful sessions for all of us. Next slide, Larry. So looking at the grade configurations, uh, we have some options going forward. So the current grade configuration you'll see in the column on the left is Memorial School with a pre-K, K and one, uh, Wheelock School grades two and three, and Dale Street grades four and five. So looking at the two options that, that we have in front of us in terms of grade configuration, um, there could be some changes to what we do with our, with our configuration of grades in the, in the district. So if we keep a four or five um, grade configuration in the new school, nothing changes. We still have a pre-K, K and one at Memorial. Uh, Wheelock remains a two, three and Dale Street uh, remains a four or five. However, if we move to the grades three through five configuration, uh, Memorial School will become a pre-K pre and kindergarten early childhood center. Um, Wheelock will house uh, grades one and two and then Dale Street becomes a three, four, five. Next slide, Larry. So looking at the four or five configuration first, clearly both of these configurations have some advantages and some challenges we need to look at. So advantages of the four or five configuration, clearly there's no current change to the grade configuration. We open up the building in a four or five and everything remains the same as we see it today. Um, a smaller student population in that school. So we, we can keep a smaller feel in that building and not build such a large building. Um, two grades uh, require a smaller building, less square footage, and obviously that's going to be less expensive to build. Um, and then potential to reduce the traffic and parking impact. We need to analyze that a little more. But in Medfield, about 80% of our elementary kids take the bus. Um, so that might be site dependent, depending whether it's on the Dale Street site um, or the Wheelock site, whether or not that becomes an issue or not. So some of the challenges that we have looking at the grades four or five configuration, it really doesn't address our projective student enrollment growth in the lower elementary. So we use uh, data from NESDEC, uh, the New England School Development Council, and also from MSBA. So we have two separate set of data um, and both are telling us that we're gonna have a large um, influx of students at the lower elementary within the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. Um, projected increases are anywhere from 20 to 30% increase. Um, doesn't really allow for an expansion of preschool and kindergarten programs. So right now we have a situation where we don't have a lot of space at Memorial and parents want more programs. We only have uh, two preschool classes right now. We actually have four teachers sharing uh, two classrooms. So that will allow us to expand our preschool programs and continue to offer additional full day that, that folks want. 
um, limits our access to a modern learning environment to only two grades. I think if we're going to make an investment, um, it would be really prudent to make sure that more the more citizens can enjoy it and use the act and use the um, facility. So limiting that to two grades can be a challenge. Um, you know, one of the things that we've also talked about is the last one that may accelerate the need for a project at Memorial or Wheelock to accommodate the projected student enrollment. Again, we need further, further analysis, but um, you could build a four or five school and then within a few years, either have to add on to that four or five school or make an addition to Wheelock and or Memorial. So that, you know, that is a challenge with the, the four or five configuration. Next, Larry. So grades three to five configuration, some of the advantages, um, definitely supports the projective student growth populations that we have coming in. So again, I know there's been some questions around the, the accuracy of the projections. We can only use what we have. So we, you know, MSBA did all their projections. We have been using NESDEC for years, even before I got here, over 400 districts uh, in the New England use NESDEC for their projections. So we're using what they, what they have given us in right now, um, the projected growth is like I said, 20 to 30% in the next 10 years. Uh, and another advantage, it creates that early childhood center and that model we talked about um, at, at Memorial, which is certainly the research around uh, early childhood education is, is vast and, and the importance of it is, is, is something that you really can't deny. Um, allows grades one and two alignment at Wheelock School. Again, that I think Christine will get into this a little more, but that's something that, that uh, pedagogically is really important for our kids. Um, allows future flexibility and long-term plans for Wheelock and Memorial School. So, you know, that gets to the point, I know Selectman Marcucci has brought up on several occasions as a member of the school building committee and also as a board of selectmen, uh, that building a larger school um, creates that flexibility that we have in the future in case there is a need to expand at, at Wheelock and or Memorial, uh, building a larger school will give us that room to do that without adding another project onto the capital list. Um, less traveling for shared staff. We share a lot of our specialists uh, in our five schools, and this will allow them to have a home base in one school, which we feel is important. Um, allowing students to become a part of a school community in th for three years instead of two. Uh, we did a survey uh, probably four or five years ago with parents, and we asked them if they liked the current structure in terms of everyone going through um, every school. So we don't have neighborhood schools, but we have every student going through. Um, all elementary schools. That was really positively received. It was over 80% of the parents like that. Um, so if we can build that, that culture and, and community a little bit more in, a three, in three years versus two, that can certainly be an advantage. Um, certainly better uh, vertical alignment of our curriculum and planning of activities for student placement. Uh, more opportunities for special education programming when you have three grades versus just two and allows for the creative scheduling around specials and curriculum. So certainly there's some advantages in the three, four, five. Uh, some of the challenges that we see uh, in the three, four, five, three grades require a larger building and a larger building is more square foot and that's gonna be a more expensive project, which I know we'll get into numbers later in the project. Um, it will require that realignment of our elementary schools, which you know Medfield has had a history of, of realignment in the past and successfully in the early 2000s, actually flipping the middle school and high school. So if you weren't around during that time, the actual uh, current middle school was the high school and the current high school was the middle school. So we've done some of these whole scale changes in the past um, and then creates a larger student population. I think that's a concern that people have that will be a large school. And I know that the design team and some of the work that we're doing will, hope, will hopefully mitigate some of that. And we'll get into that as, as part of the, the process as well. Um, I think Christine, I think you're next. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, tonight I'll share what the research says about grade configuration at the elementary level. Now it's really important to note that underlying all teaching and learning at all levels is child's development, specifically implementing curriculum and instruction that best supports students at their particular developmental level. Now, as such, there are three impacts educationally that would be outcomes of a pre-K, K, one, two, three, five grade configuration change. And I'm gonna be walking through those with you right now. Uh, the first one is instruction and staffing. Now keep in mind the instruction and staffing across the grade levels adopt different strategies depending on the, the developmental level of the child. So uh, pre-K and K, it's more experientially based very much than they transition into centers, um, learning centers. And grade one continues with the learning center focus, but then they start introducing project-based learning, which that continues 
three through five, where you have a, a greater infusion of project-based learning as well as independent learning. But those are attuned to the developmental stage of the students at that age. Now, related to that is ed prep. My background is in education preparation. I've spent over 10 years in the uh, higher ed level as, as for my recent um, time at Boston College. And college uh, preparation programs, as well as the state, align preparation of teachers around these developmental levels. Specifically, there are two different licenses, early childhood that goes from pre-K up to grade two, and then elementary, which is one through six. But it really acknowledges that the, the uniqueness of that early childhood level and how different it is from a, an older elementary school at a grade three to five, for instance. The second thing is curriculum. And curriculum, uh, including the mass frameworks, are aligned to the child development stages. Um, for instance, um, math, um, science, as well as literacy. Uh, for example, literacy, um, the early years um, with younger kids, you have more of a learning to read strategy that happens. It's more phonologically based. Um, students are learning skills. And that transition happens around grade three, where you start reading to learn, where it's more of application of, of the skill set learned and learning literacy more thematically. The third piece is, of course, is child development. And with child development, we're thinking about transitions and what is the most developmentally appropriate place where students transition schools. Uh, transition is always a challenge for all students to transition. But to have students transition and have those experiences that are aligned best, it finds that a three, five configuration, especially students entering into a grade three situation that they are developmentally um, more aligned to grades four and five um, than a grade two, for instance, going into a uh, grade two and three situation. Next. We've had uh, numerous opportunities over the past few months to, to look at the public participation. We certainly have some, some key times coming up as well. Uh, we started this process in, this, in December, looking at our initial community workshop and school building committee meeting um, early in December. In February, we looked at our, our uh, community visioning workshop, school committee meeting, community parent and teacher survey that, that started in January and finished up in February, um, school building committee meeting again in February, community forum in March, um, we had a quad meeting in April, which was the Board of Selectmen, Warrant, Warrant Committee, School Committee, and School Building Committee, just talking about the whole the project as a whole and uh, getting some feedback from those boards, which was very helpful for us. And then also at another School Building Committee at that point. Um, and then May, our public forum now, we, had a, we also had a School Building Committee. So there's really some upcoming opportunities that folks can take advantage of uh, to provide more input to us. So one of them is the town-wide online survey. So we'll be launching a survey tomorrow. We have a subcommittee of the school building committee that's worked real hard on communications and improving the communications. Uh, they, they developed that survey that we'll launch then. Uh, we also have a school committee meeting uh, this week on the 21st, which great configuration will be on that agenda. And Christine will go in even more detail on, um, on different uh, avenues around pedagogy. Uh, we have the school building committee meeting on the 27th. Uh, I know that members of the school building committee will be uh, presenting results of the online survey to the board of selectmen on the second. Uh, we have a school committee meeting again on the fourth in which we'll be discussing grade configuration. And at that point are scheduled to make a decision on grade configuration based on uh, feedback that we get in, on the online survey and the school committee will be voting that. Um, and then on June 10th, uh, school building committee again, in which they'll be making some recommendations on that. So lots of opportunities to remain engaged even after tonight. And we hope that you'll take advantage of those uh, going forward. Um, thanks, Jeff. And now we sort of wanted to pivot and talk a little bit about the studies that Arrow Street and our uh, consultant team is starting to work on. Um, and these are happening concurrent to the work that Jeff was just outlining. Um, and as you can see, the Mass School Building Authority, the MSBA, does require a very extensive and thorough analysis of all the different bits and pieces that go into the project um, in the goal to make it a uh, success. So one of the things we looked at and then have uh, presented several times um, to the um, various committees and the quad board meeting 
Um, we did identify six sites that were potential sites across the town and town owned sites that could be used for a uh, potential um, new or renovated Dale Street School. Uh, three of those sites were up at the old Hospital Hill site. Uh, the existing Dale and Wheelock School sites were identified as well as the site at the Redgate Farm. Um, we went through an extensive process developing and understanding each of the uh, opportunities constraints of those sites. And I believe this was back in March, uh, presented that to the committee and the vote was taken to uh, eliminate four of the sites and really focus our attention on the existing Dale and Memorial School site, as well as the Wheelock School. And I, th I think the good thing is as uh, uh, the architect on the project, we really have some strong sites to work on there. Um, these are two uh, sort of aerial photographs and maps showing the existing sites. Uh, let me find my mouse, there it is. So on your left here is the existing Dale. So Dale Street down uh, to the south of the site, there's an existing field in the middle and then Memorial uh, up here towards the Northern end of the site, um, as well as Wheelock, the existing Wheelock School is here, um, sort of in the middle towards the front along Elm Street. Um, there is a space behind the building that we are looking at for a potential new construction if we were to go on this site, as well as existing uh, soccer fields um, that are part of that location. Um, we are going through a number of issues really again to sort of thoroughly understand the issues related to the site um, and we just wanted to tick off those. Those are in process. Um, so we do not have answers necessarily tonight, but we are going through the discussion and we anticipate um, in the upcoming meetings to then begin to hone in on one of the other of the two sites. But we're doing geotechnical studies, um, geoenvironmental, which means checking the condition of the soils as well as um, what we can use for bearing. Um, we're looking at traffic, parking, and pedestrian circulation, historic resources, wetlands and aquifer protection requirements, uh, the permitting requirements. We are doing some studies, which I'll show a bit of that in a minute, looking at the utilities infrastructure, construction impacts and disruptions, particularly if we think about a renovation scheme, um, and also, of course, and uh, importantly, costs. Uh, what is the necessary cost for the project? So we have a number of alternatives. Um, these are somewhat driven by the uh, Mass School Building Authority, as well as some we have developed as part of the discussions with the School Building Committee. Um, one of the things they request is what is known as the base repair scheme. Uh, the MSBA requires if you were to just fix code requirements for the building, what would that take to do? So we have a list of those and we are, um, studying those essentially without any spatial improvements to the building that would uh, allow bigger classrooms or more space. Uh, they also require us to do what's called an ad reno scheme. What would happen if we were to try and uh, renovate the existing building as well as add new to it? Um, and what you're seeing and one of the things we start to study is um, how do we sort of occupy the building while we uh, renovate and replace large portions of it. So adding classrooms, adding a uh, full-size gym and cafeteria, as well as upgrading the existing educational spaces. We're also looking at a new school uh, located in the field between the existing Dale and Memorial um, school buildings. Um, in this case, the existing Dale Street school would be turned back to the town for use for other purposes. A new building would be built between the two and uh, we would then um, have shared parking and other um, resources, play fields and playgrounds and things. On the Wheelock site, again, we're looking at two new construction alternatives, uh, both essentially, as I mentioned, behind the existing Wheelock here new school in this location. Um, we're looking into various um, changes to the um, access drives, parking, bus, and parent pickup and drop off, 
and developing a uh, understanding of what that would be like. We're also looking at a second alternative there, trying to pull it a little closer to the street and have a little more direct relationship to the existing building. So those um, studies are ongoing. We're looking not only at the site planning issues, but also the internal arrangement of spaces, uh, working with the MSBA space template, uh, as well as with uh, Superintendent Marsden's team, um, understanding the needs for the new school. So we will continue those studies um, through really through the end of the summer. We will pick one of the particular alternatives to become our preferred option. And then um, we will review that with the MSBA in the early fall. And assuming everybody is in agreement, we then move into what is called schematic design, which will be the fall uh, for a more robust development of the building. Um, we've done a first pass at costs for the various options. Um, you see here that these, um, we would like to caution, these are very conceptual numbers. Uh, we try to use these more to compare back and forth to each other than necessarily to say that these are the ultimate costs for the buildings. Um, and you can see also, they range. Larry, uh, just interrupt for one second. Yeah, sure, Mike. Since these estimates were put out, uh, we've also eliminated some options. So it's a little bit fuzzy. This costs are a little bit dated. We'll talk more about costs later. Sure, thank you for that. And what you'll see here, Again, for each site, Dale Street site, Wheelock site, each of the alternatives we're developing, each of the grade level configurations, whether a four, five or a three, four, five. And then these are ranges for construction. Uh, we have worked with an estimator to try and develop those at this very early stage. And then estimated project costs, which is really the overall cost for the project. Um, and as we mentioned, the base repair scheme, which is very much uh, developed or required, excuse me, by the MSBA um, is quite a bit less um, simply because we are not addressing many of the more fundamental issues of the building. Um, we did wanna point out um, a likely premium, again, uh, very much a work in progress, somewhere between 16 to $20 million additional costs for the um, additional grade. So having the third grade in the same building, um, again, a rough order of magnitude. So the, share, the town's share of this premium estimated somewhere in the 11 to $15 million uh, for that. So again, very much conceptual pricing. Uh, we would be doing another round of pricing um, as we approach the end of our preferred schematic report, which will be later this summer. And then we continue to do more pricing as the project develops, um, including the schematic design segment in the fall. We will do pricing in the uh, late fall once we have developed the building and site plans further. So with that, let me turn it over to Mike to talk through next steps. Sure, so um, one of our key next steps is going to be a survey that's going to be released uh, by, uh, I think it's gonna go out in the morning. Um, we highly encourage participation in this. Um, please note that there will be only one, uh, one survey per IP address. So, um, you know, please don't try to <laughs> submit multiple of the same. Um, so, uh, but it's basically going to uh, touch on some of the issues we talked about tonight, get, start to hear from some of you on what your preferences are. Um, I can't stress how important it is for you to share that information with us. Um, so we really get a temperature for where the town stands. Um, obviously, these are really uncertain times and this, this whole world is changing around us on a daily basis. So we really wanna understand um, how the town is feeling about this project and some of the decisions that are upcoming uh, before we decide how to proceed. So please, uh, it's, a, I believe, a three minute or less survey um, and it, we may do others depending on the outcome of this, but um, we really wanna be able to gather um, a, a statistically significant amount of data um, from the community. So uh, please look forward to that and share with your friends and, and, and the people that you know to make sure we can get as much participation as possible. We do have some meetings uh, scheduled coming up. Um, as, as you know, this is going to be you know, certainly a topic, it may not be the most important topic at this time uh, as we deal with a pandemic, but uh, the, this will be 
moving forward for the for the time being as we um, gather feedback from the town. Um, we've already been given a two month extension on our original schedule from the MSBA. Um, so we're in constant communication with the MSBA. Um, they're obviously dealing with many communities. And I can tell you from my professional experience, we're working with communities that are moving full speed ahead. And we're moving um, and we have uh, other communities that are that are slowing things down and, and pausing for a little bit to reassess. So um, we really want to hear from the town and get a feel for uh, what your thoughts are in that regard. So um, upcoming meetings, obviously, the school committee, um, we do have a scheduled school building committee at the end of the month. Um, I have on here uh, a board of selectmen's meeting where I intend to give the selectmen an update based on the feedback we received from the survey as well as the outcome of tonight. Um, and, and then um, another school committee meeting on the 4th and um, in the a school building committee meeting on June 10th. So um, this is our current plan. Things will, will change as need, as need be, but uh, these are all uh, public meetings. Obviously we're working in a digital format, which I think is actually may turn out to be a benefit to us because we've got so much more participation than uh, when we were meeting in person. So I, I uh, appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, we're up to 146 attendees right now. So um, which is the highest I've seen in, in a public meeting since town meeting last year. So that's uh, that's great. Next slide, Larry. So where are we going? What are we going to do uh, after tonight? Um, as I mentioned, uh, we definitely want to hear from you. Um, we want to hear your feedback. We do have a plan to move forward currently, um, but as, as I noted, it's constantly shifting depending on uh, how this pandemic is playing out. So um, ultimately our current plan is to, is to evaluate the site and option studies and eventually a selection at the end of August uh, with the preferred schematic report to be submitted in September to the MSBA. Uh, and that's ahead of their uh, board vote in October. Um, that would allow us to proceed into schematic design from October through February. We negotiate with the MSBA what their portion of the project would cost. And then we would potentially um, ask the town to vote on project funding at um, uh, a meeting next year. And it may be a second night as a special town meeting given the gravity of this decision. Um, and that would lead to an approximate start of construction in August of the following year. And it's about a two year construction period to open the building in 2024. Again, that's, that's a fluid schedule. It, it's going to shift and, and adjust as, as needed, but that is our current plan. And that is uh, where we are proceeding as of tonight. Next slide. So before I open this up to discussion, um, again, I just wanted to note that um, I really love to hear all of your questions. Please try to uh, submit them under the Q&A. Um, we'll try to address all of them. Uh, we did take a little bit more time than I expected on the presentation, but uh, we're gonna stay here until we can answer as many questions as possible. I'm gonna try to take them from um, one person at a time, just so that um, everybody has a chance to speak. And, um, and then if we run out of questions, I'll, I'll uh, um, you know, when we may throw a few questions that are frequently asked questions out there that we've, we've come across. Um, and as such, if uh, you prefer, um, when I ask, when I answer these questions, I may um, open it up to unmute you to be able to discuss with the group. So, all right, so um, bear with me uh, as we get through this. So. First question I have um, is from uh, Bob Herbserber, um, and he is asking, um, and this may need some clarification, but so why are grades put into separate wings in the school? Third graders spend 90% of their time with other third graders. Um, so I guess that would probably be uh, Jeff or Christine. I, I, I'd be happy to start. Um, I'm looking at things from a curriculum standpoint. Uh, curriculum is grouped uh, for depend depending on de developmental level. And that's something I discussed in my talk. And so it's just to be concrete, for instance, you have uh, concepts such as mathematics where it's number sense, pre-K to K. Those are two, like that's 
taught within a, a certain grouping, addition and subtra uh, subtraction in, group, in grades one and two, and division, multiplication, fractions in three through five. Um, so it, it's more than just a wing. It, it's to have teachers and how they learn and how they instruct um, to, to meet the students in their developmental level in the like way. Um, it allows from us on a district level and on a school level to think about things like professional development, um, how best to support teachers as they learn to support the students at this level, uh, curriculum, making sure curriculum supplies, um, library, uh, media, all of that is developmentally uh, attuned. Um, and in thinking about just um, just working on curricula itself and making sure that they're, they're connected. So the concept of project-based learning, for instance, project-based learning is, is developmentally appropriate from grades three through five and beyond. So thinking about how best to support those teachers, you're looking at more than just a wing, you're looking at continuity within the school. Thanks, Christine. Um, Next up, it's um, not a not a question, but I actually appreciate the, the, the thought uh, from Russ Hallisey, who says, I hope all your future meetings will be on Zoom, easiest way for the residents to observe. Um, I completely agree. Um, we'll have to take that one up with the Attorney General, because um, uh, we're going to have to extend these allowances on open meeting laws in order for that to occur. Um, but I, I completely agree, and it's clearly shown up in the participation tonight. So, Russ, thank you for that. All right, next question I have um, looks like uh, Victoria Leah, who asks, how confident are you that the MSBA will follow through regarding their financial offer, considering the financial straits that our state is in because of the cost of COVID-19? Uh, this is an excellent question, and it's a question that every every community that's in the program is asking the MSBA right now. And the MSBA's answer to that is that all of the projects that are in their current pipeline, uh, there is gonna be no change to their, their financial commitments to them. Um, they actually still continue to invite um, other districts into their pipeline. Um, the way that they have phrased it is that it'll affect future projects and they don't know the answer to how that'll affect future projects, um, but they're, response to um, our community and other communities has been that it, they are still proceeding uh, with all projects within their pipeline. Uh, next up, um, I have uh, Sarah Becker. Um, she says, it looks like uh, Wheelock 4-5 cost was 66 to 83 million. The Dale Street Three to five cost was 90 to 105. That is a difference of about 23 million, quite significant. How much of the total project costs will be paid by the MSBA? Uh, another excellent question. So we don't know to be to be frank, the, um, the current reimbursement rate for Medfield is 39.84%, um, uh, um, but that is not uh, an effective rate. They have, they have caps on certain things like for instance, site construction costs are capped at 8%. Um, overall building costs are, are, are capped on a, on a per square foot number. So there are things that ultimately end up with a reduced contribution from them that is not equivalent. And a lot of it depends on some of the decisions we make. There are other ways that we can incentive, they incentivize us to achieve better energy performance by adding a 2% incentive uh, if we achieve certain goals from an energy performance perspective. Um, as well, they will evaluate uh, the town's history of maintaining buildings. They obviously want any investment and large investment in these types of buildings to be maintained. And if the town has demonstrated that they put the effort in to maintain these buildings, there's uh, also incentive points there. So the answer is we don't know as of yet. I could tell you it, it will be less than, than the 39.84 that we are um, estimating, I mean, that, that we are uh, currently assigned by the MSBA, that, that reimbursement rate will not change. Um, but when, when it all is said and done, and, and there's a very extensive spreadsheet that um, will basically spit out the number that we'll uh, get to eventually, my, my guess is we, we're probably going to be in the range of 30% or so, um, depending on some of those incentives, et cetera. Um, so 
Again, very rough estimates at these time. At this time, we're still very early in this process. You know, to use a football reference, we're on about the 10, 10 or 15 yard line here. Um, yes, we'll continue to update you as we know more in that regard. Um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, there's one question in here that's just initials. I'm going to ask that you please put your full name. Um, I, I don't want to be taking questions from anonymous people. I think I turned that off. Um, we do uh, want to keep this in the in the interest of open meetings where uh, people normally state their name and address. I won't necessarily ask for addresses, but please put your full name. Uh, all right. Next up, I have Stephen Resch. Um, and he says that uh, will all the options shown on slide 27 and 28 repair, addition four or five, addition three, four or five, new building four or five, and new building three, four or five, all be getting more careful, precise cost analysis for must precision or must decision be made to narrow down the options to move forward with before the more detailed cost analysis is produced. Will the cost analysis include operating costs and or future capital costs? and our revenue cost implications of other uses of buildings, land, at sites under consideration. Um, so that's, that's a lot, um, but all very good um, questions. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, there, there will certainly be more precise cost analysis. We're not looking to make um, the ultimate decision on the project without that kind of detailed analysis. Um, in terms of the um, grade configuration, um, we are looking to try to see if we can get to a decision on that. Um, I don't know that the order of magnitude uh, is going to vary greatly from what we've estimated. Um, we feel that we were pretty comfortable with that range in order to make that decision. And the reason why we're looking as that's the, the, mo the most important decision. The reason why we're looking for that up front is to be able to narrow down these options into, into the real options that we want to focus on as a community. Um, so that's the idea is to is to by by making the decision on grade configuration, we cut our options almost in half. Um, and then um, we still need to carry the base repair option that um, the MSBA requires. Um, in terms of operating costs and future capital costs, um, those are also things that we will factor in. Um, operating costs um, are, are always estimated and it's really difficult to project out too far because energy prices um, continue to fluctuate wildly. So uh, that'll be definitely something that we look at when we look at selection of mechanical and electrical and plumbing systems, um, because those decisions on are often, um, it's a matter of how much do you wanna pay now in order to pay less later. Um, as we look at the life cycle cost of the, of the overall systems and you know the implications of burning fossil fuels, et cetera. So, all of those will be um, discussed as we uh, get deeper into the design. Um, and then the, uh, the question on future capital costs, um, the, I'm not fully aware of the entire future capital plan uh, that um, is out there. I know the selectmen are working closely uh, with the Warren Committee on some of those things. My understanding is there's a roof project that's probably four to five years out for uh, a couple of schools. Um, but um, obviously those things would, would factor in, and, um, but I don't believe there's any other major capital um, project. I know the, the Park and Rec is, is um, considering trying to pursue their projects, um, but that would certainly um, be for the community to decide if that was a worthwhile um, proceeding with. Um, next up, we have uh, Christian Donner. Christian asks, uh, I see that the committee recently approved a change order for 55,000 that adds environmental testing and a site survey. How was this not included in the original bid? Why did the committee not think it was needed if it wasn't? And if the committee did think it was needed, why was it missed? Okay, um, it's not actually a change order. So um, what we, how we award the design of this project is uh, we brought on uh, Arrow Street and their in their group of consultants. They have to submit all of their consultants as part of the designer selection process. Um, and then we go into negotiations and we negotiate fees with um, um, Arrow Street, which we did first. And we awarded Arrow Street their contract. 
uh, at, then we took a, a look through what's called supplemental services, and that's the site survey, the environmental testing, the geotech borings, uh, and all of those things that allow us to help evaluate sites um, for selection. And those fees, um, once we negotiated, made sure the scope was appropriate, um, came in and we approved what's called an amendment. And what that means is it's we amend uh, Arrow Street's contract to include those sub consultants um, to approve that work. Uh, it was identified from the beginning. It was identified within the proposal. Uh, it was not uh, missed and it is not a quote unquote change order. We did have budget set aside for that scope. But we wanted to make sure that we were um, selecting it appropriately and not, not um, spending any more money than we needed to. Okay, uh, next question is from Teresa James. She says, uh, please expand on the pre-K curriculum in a pre-K K configuration from Memorial. Is it operationally still half days or full days? Enrollment projection difference at the pre-K level, question mark. So, um, Jeff, can, that, can you answer that one? Sure, so one of the things that we're looking at with um, early childhood center in a pre-K K model is we would be able to expand our kindergarten to 10 full day classes, uh, one or two half day classes, and then have an entire preschool wing of at least uh, six classes where we'd be able to have a combination of full day, half day, depending on what the community wants. Um, I know that at one point when I first got here, we did have some have different models. We, we ran out of space. Um, so we would really program that based on what the community needs were, and we would send surveys out like we have in the past to try to get a sense of where people are. Um, we'd also like to do a transitional program as part of that in the early childhood where we actually do a, a pre-K K program or a K-1 program where some kids are really aren't developmentally ready to go to the next level. We could hold them there and, and provide them additional support before they go on to the next grade. So um, that's our vision for it. So we want to expand almost a pre-K for all program if we could. Um, certainly tuition based, uh, but, but something that we think that our kids need and uh, our community deserves. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Um, next question is from Kevin Stoddard, and he asks, is the timeline the same whether you build at Dale Street or Wheelock? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so the only difference in timeline would be if the um, if the eventual option was the ad reno. The ad rental would significantly significantly extend the construction period, um, as well as add requirements for logistics, et cetera, uh, as we tried to uh, build in its existing place while school is still in operation. So, um, if it's a new construction option, then it would be the same on either site, um, and give or take, obviously, but um, basically the same about a two-year construction period. Um, so the uh, ad reno, just to be clear, the ad reno would probably stretch closer to 30 months or so and, and perhaps beyond um, just because of the, the phasing and logistics involved with uh, building uh, in an enterprise uh, school. With an enterprise school. All right, next question I have is from Gerard Irwin. Are the slides you presented available someplace where they can be downloaded? And so uh, they will be posted. Um, I, Jeff, I don't know if you have a timing of that, but that's gonna go up on the project website. Yeah, we can get that up tomorrow morning. Okay. Next question from Alex Stevens. Where are we in the process of setting sustainability energy performance goals for the building? It seemed to be a high priority among many participants in the earlier working group meetings. How does that process move forward? Does that question or topic appear in the survey? Uh, it does not appear in the initial survey. Uh, certainly uh, part of the survey, what it does allow is, is the opportunity to present some questions back. Um, certainly um, sustainability and energy performance goals uh, are gonna be a topic of conversation. Uh, we've started the conversation. There's a lot more of it to be had. It's not the most pressing decision just yet, 
uh, with the uh, great configuration and site selection, um, in some essences needs to happen, uh, decisions need to happen before the energy performance goals because uh, we need to identify which site specifically because the energy performance on either site may, may, may differ. Um, so that's part of that discussion, but I can tell you that um, I've had a little bit of back and forth with the energy committee and they are, I, I believe, putting forth some recommendations to um, the Board of Selectmen on what they feel the uh, group should pursue. Um, from my perspective as the School Building Committee Chair, um, that's not for us to set policy. So if, if the town wants to achieve some sort of sustainability or energy performance goals, um, I believe that there should be some some of that needs to be set and filtered through the selectmen as ultimately the executive authority. Um, we'll certainly be doing more presentations on that as we evaluate different options from a sustainability perspective. Um, because as I noted, there's upfront costs associated with that, uh, as, as I know Alec knows well as, uh, as well. And sometimes that pays off quickly and we just need to um, understand that we're making an investment over time. The question is how much can the um, town summit in terms of upfront investment? So um, definitely a good question. Uh, as far as how that process moves forward, I don't have any next steps currently, um, but uh, as we start to develop that, I'll make sure that you're kept in the loop as, as well as the uh, energy committee. All right, um, next up, uh, Paul Narkowicz, and I hope I'm not butchering that name. Um, at the time of the vote of the preferred option, is this based on the community preferred option? So uh, that's a good question. And that's why we're here to discuss tonight. And, and, and again, through the summer, we're going to be gathering more feedback on, on what the community does prefer. Um, so uh, by all means, that's, part, that's a key part of the survey. So um, you'll be given some opportunity to discuss what the preferred option is for configuration first and then as I noted we'll be doing more on site selection with the public to gather feedback on the selection of the sites obviously you know it's a it's certainly a challenging time to be able to make that decision as we can't necessarily get all the information we normally would specifically around traffic which I know will come up um, so we can definitely talk more about that um, but, um, to answer your question uh, ultimately the, the vote is on the preferred option. When, when the town votes to, a, to approve funding, it's on the preferred option. The, the uh, opportunity for the public to you know, state their, their preference is, is throughout this process, and, and including tonight, so, um, and including the survey, et cetera. I hope that answers your question. Um, next up, uh, it, it's like uh, Sarah Becker, it looks like the base cost to renovate Dale Street, which I am not in favor of, were 22 million. If I recall correctly, I noted that the existing Dale Street building will be returned to town for future use, understanding that renovation investment to make the building fit for a future purpose, purpose would be significant. How will we balance new school costs, the cost to repurpose or demolish the former Dale Street school? So uh, good questions. In terms of the, the $22 million option, that's the base repair option. Um, and that uh, is often, uh, basically that's what the MSBA uses just to compare that to a new project. So people can see that there's no real sort of zero cost option um, because the, the current condition of the school is not conducive to um, delivering education the way uh, it should be. Um, in terms of the, the future disposition of Dale Street, were it to be uh, abandoned, so to speak, um, that's, that's a good question and it's, it's not decided. Uh, if I could tell you that if we do build a new school on the Dale Street site, the MSBA would participate in any demolition costs. Should, should we choose to demolish it? We don't necessarily need to demolish it. And then if uh, we do choose to uh, move the school to the Wheelock site, then um, the MSBA wouldn't participate in any demolition, um, but we could discuss uh, the repurposing and the MSBA would require us to start to have that discussion. We don't necessarily have that uh, decided 
with this project, but the uh, disposition of the Dale Street School is is something that we would tell the MSBA that um, we would need to explore in further detail. It has been discussed in the past as a potential uh, future home of uh, Parks and Rec. Um, I'm not saying that's the right answer. I'm not saying it's the wrong answer. Um, so it, it, it's certainly part of the discussion. And um, I know there's gonna be a lot of opinions on, on what we should do with that a school should we decide not to keep it in its current condition. Uh, next up, we have Michelle Bonnet. Uh, and she says, uh, during the two year construction period, is there a site that is less disruptive to the students? So um, I think both sites personally, and, and Larry, you can chime in if you feel otherwise, uh, both sites would be uh, in, in new construction options would have uh, heavy construction going on adjacent to other schools. So I think they're equal in that regard. Um, obviously the most disruptive option is an ad reno in place um, because of the phasing and logistics uh, regarding you know temporary facilities like modular classrooms, et cetera. So um, Larry, anything to add there? No, I think you said it well, Mike. I I think in the case of new construction, the idea is to build a, the new school on one of the fields, either a Dale or Wheelock, move the students in, um, and then they're off and running. Um, and those are likely to be similar impacts. There may be slight variations. The Dale Street is a little more of a congested area of town. Wheelock has a little more space around it. Um, so we want to take that into consideration, both um, the impact on the school itself, as well as impact on neighbors, particularly around Dale. But I, I would agree with your assessment. They're generally about equal with the exception of the ad reno scheme, which really would be, uh, you know, it's living in your house while you're renovating it. And um, that's tricky. We've done it before, um, but it's a long and arduous process. Sorry. Uh, next question from Elizabeth Marset. If Memorial were to become an early childhood center with pre-K and kindergarten only, how much in additional tuition minus additional staffing costs would Medford make? Uh, that's a good question, Bonnie. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of factors in that right now because we don't know whether tuition will increase, decrease, or whether or not we would go to tuition-free full-day kindergarten, which has been a goal of the district for, for some time now, but it just financially hasn't worked out for us. So we haven't calculated that much. We haven't calculated that because we don't know, uh, number one, the amount of students, and number two, what tuition would be at that point. All right, uh, next up we have Robert. Aigler, I apologize, A-I-G-L-E-R, apologize if I butcher your name. What are the most important criteria for deciding the Wheelock versus Dale Street alternatives? Is the committee biased against the renovation alternative? Um, so um, there's a lot of criteria and we're, we're still developing that as, as, as we evaluate the sites uh, that go into deciding the Wheelock versus Dale Street alternatives. Um, educational is, is the first and foremost, both either site would need to be able to support the educational uh, plan that the district has put together. Um, obviously, we look at uh, costs, we look at um, the site's ability from a, uh, to accommodate it from um, a space perspective. We look at fields, we look at um, um, utilities, we look at um, you know, the site's uh, conditions from a geotechnical perspective, whether the soil is light and it's a port of building. Um, there's a lot, I think um, we're going to be um, discussing that in more detail. Um, traffic we talked about, that's gonna be tough for us to really evaluate uh, given that the schools are shut down for the year, we weren't able to get a good traffic study together. So we're doing some analysis with our traffic engineer on that. Um, busing, how that's impacted. Um, and that's a question that that's come up. One of the things that just so we're clear on busing, uh, currently the buses, uh, all, all elementary school buses stop at all three schools. 
So the only difference that would change would be the wheel lock site. If, if we did uh, choose the wheel lock site, we would eliminate one bus drop off because they would then only stop at the wheel lock site and that memorial as opposed to a current condition, um, which is all three schools. Um, so in terms of is the com com committee biased against the renovation alternative? Uh, my answer is no. Um, I can tell you, though, that there are significant challenges and costs associated with those types of projects. Um, as I mentioned, they obviously they run longer um, because of all of the phasing and logistics. You basically have to uh, move some kids out of certain areas into temporary facilities, demolish, build new, shift other kids or other other services um, out of certain areas, demolish, you know, renovate. Uh, so there is definitely some some premium associated with adding all of that, those temporary conditions, temporary modular classrooms. Um, they are definitely very challenging projects. There, there are many examples of them, um, though I, I wouldn't say it's the majority in terms of what towns choose to do. Um, but is it biased against it? No, absolutely. It will get its fair review uh, as all the options will. All right, uh, next up. Um, so Chris McHugh, um, this is a question for Christine Power. And so uh, I'm going to read this out to you. Student stress is growing at elementary level versus 10 years ago. Please point us to research on grade three being more appropriately matched with grade four and five versus grade two. Many teachers and parents are concerned about pushing kids to grow up too fast and before developmentally ready. Please advise, most research I've seen is focused on transition issues being most problematic from grade five to six, but nothing about grades three, four, and five. Okay, that's a whole lot of question. Um, so uh, just to uh, start, first of all, a uh, student's trust is something that's incredibly important to everyone within the district and within the school. And I would argue that it's something that is important pre-K all the way to grade 12. And that's something that we're seeing and we are implementing each and every day more and more curricula to support those kids um, and support the uh, social emotional well-being of our students. Um, specifically uh, to, to look at what research, uh, most of the research really is um, both higher ed, uh, educator preparation, uh, the licensure in within Massachusetts and multiple other states really base their work around the preeminent organization in early childhood, which is the National Organization, uh, National Association of the Education of Young Children, or NACI. Uh, NACI has been around for a long time, and they designated that early childhood is defined as birth through grade, uh, through age eight, which is grade two. And they make an argument from a child's development perspective that teaching and learning, supporting kids, all of that is uh, needs to be unique in order to support the unique age of that of those students, um, pre-K, K, grade one, grade two. And that learning and teaching does look fundamentally different. And that's something that comes through. And again, education preparation programs, we have separate licensure um, courses child development um, specific uh, uh, curriculum. All of that reflects that, but that's just one piece. This is a widely accepted designation um, between early childhood and elementary. You know, Mike, I would also add too that this isn't a novel idea that we thought up a three, four, five. There's, um, there's over 30 elementary schools in Massachusetts right now that use the three, four, five configuration. Yeah, well in excess of 30, I believe. <laughs> All right. Um, sorry, bear with me. And just to note to people, um, you need to identify yourself on, on your questions, not just your initials. Um, I am going to skip over some of those uh, unless you provide some clarification as to who's asking the question. All right. Uh, next question I have is from Steve Kasky. Uh, who asks if, uh, sorry, how will the Wheelock project, if built on the backfields, affect the soccer fields? Um, Larry, can you just throw up the uh, Wheelock site just so we can explain an answer to that one? Sure. Um, and the two schemes we're looking at for Wheelock in both cases, the existing soccer fields 
um, which are here. We are uh, preserving those and um, concentrating our efforts um, to the west of those, looking at a site that is near to the existing wheel lock. Uh, we like the idea of some sort of uh, shared courtyard, uh, a little differentiated on each side of the courtyard for each school, but nevertheless a space that has a, a sense of enclosure and a sense of um, um, activity and then allowing um, improvements to the roadway and parking to support both buildings plus frankly support the existing soccer field a little better than it is today. Um, so in both schemes that we're looking at, again this one where we're coming a little closer, uh, we're actually looking at um, not bringing a driveway through the back here but bringing it down in this way. Um, we are preserving the soccer fields. So I'm, I'm going to add on because there's a similar question uh, from Bob Herb Suber just while we're on the topic. Um, he, he's asking, can you please address public access of the wheel of property? Seems like no consideration from the site plan to this. Hundreds of people use that open space a week. Um, certainly, I, uh, I am well aware I spend plenty of hours on, on those fields with my daughter um, and her soccer teams all the time. Um, it's not something that's being ignored. Matter of fact, we're looking at ways to improve it. Um, the options would help, certainly help the parking situation as uh, the parking for the school could be utilized um, in a uh, better fashion. Um, as, as Larry noted, those, the back existing soccer fields would not be affected in either of these options. Uh, it's the, uh, the mixed use fields that are directly behind Wheelock that are most impacted. Um, but there is no intention to restrict or otherwise hinder any sort of public access to Wheelock property. If anything, um, some of the new school's uh, public amenities like the gym, uh, which would be used on weekends for basketball and other, other events, um, would certainly um, still be functioning on, on, uh, as an available resource to the town. Um, and that's true of, of either option that you know, the intention here is if we're building this facility that it's not just for schools during the day and we would be able to potentially get also get some rent revenue for things like the gym, where I, which I know Medfield Youth Basketball struggles to find space for. So, um, so uh, in terms of public access to Wheelock, it will be hindered in no, no form or fashion. All right, uh, next up I have uh, Megan Sullivan. Megan asks, uh, Medfield is planning the new Dale Street School for the future, so we need to make sure it's really ready for the future. Just last month, in the midst of the pandemic and economic fallout, Governor Charlie Baker announced his commitment to Massachusetts reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050. In order to achieve this new individual projects, particularly those municipal projects with use life expectancies of 50 plus years, must be built to meet that standard now. How is the Dale Street project planning uh, going to incorporate this net zero goal and sustainability. So um, again, this is sort of feeding off of uh, Alex's uh, question earlier on. Um, the, the, the town right now does not have a net zero goal. It has not been um, uh, something that the town has, has pulled together. Some other towns have. Um, certainly if, if the town chose to go that route, uh, we would direct the project to do the same. Um, but we're looking for feedback from the community on, on uh, those types of decisions as we get into the selection of systems. I can tell you there's a premium associated with that. Um, and there's uh, many of our school projects are going for um, net zero ready, which is a bit of a step back from actual net zero. It basically, um, you know, allows for what was called a very low EUI project. Um, and fossil fuel free projects, which would basically mean choosing to go with all electric systems. Uh, those types of decisions, uh, I think, will be ongoing. Uh, if you're interested in those conversations, um, the survey will have a place for you to put in your, your email, and uh, we hope to um, get your input for those. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, next question I have is from uh, Katie N. Uh, Katie Novak. Thank you, Katie. Uh, 
will map Medfield after school program buildings still be able to be located on each grade level site? I'm going to can answer that. Jeff. Uh, thanks, Mike. So we've had meetings uh, with map as, as part of this process, and we have uh, told them that they are absolutely included in this process. We want to make sure they are a critical component to what we do every day and they support our kids before and after school hours. So they are definitely a part of this process. Uh, we've met with a board member and the director. Uh, we actually have a dedicated space in the plans. Um, we're not sure if they'll stay there because it won't be reimbursable, but we have dedicated space for, for MAP in the current uh, renditions of both the four five and the three four five. All right, uh, next question is from uh, Bill Harvey. Bill asks, will any previous school bonds be retired for the borrowing, uh, before the borrowing for this project commence? Um, excellent question. And this is definitely something I'm actually been working on putting some analysis together for. I've been working with Christine Trevor, the, the um, town administrator, and uh, Nick Milano, the assistant town administrator, as we start to evaluate these costs and what it means for the uh, citizens of the town and taxpayers. Um, and we do try to time these as, as strategically as possible. Um, the, the last major, and I say major, I know we did the public safety building in the DPW about uh, five years or so ago. Um, that's not in my eyes major, this is far more major. Those were in the range of 10 to uh, $18 million in borrowings. Um, given the, the difference in um, the size of the borrowing that would be estimated for this project. Um, we are going to be looking at how the debt from the previous three school project from the late 90s and early 2000s um, is actually good timing because that's coming off the books over the next couple of years. Um, so depending on the time, overall timing of this, there may be some overlap, but overall our debt service payments over the next uh, three to four years are gonna be declining by approximately a total of $3 million per year. Um, so that will help mitigate uh, the expense of this project. So I will say it's it's not all net add. There are uh, that all that debt will be coming off the books um, in the coming years, which will help mitigate it. Obviously, this is um, a much bigger expense than the uh, projects from uh, 20 years ago. So um, it, there still will be an add of overall debt to uh, our books, um, and we'll, we expect to have more data on that. I have a good analysis that I've started to put together, but I need to um, talk it through with uh, Chairman Gus Murby from the Board of Selectmen before uh, that goes out to the public as uh, we need to finalize a few numbers. So um, look for more information on that upcoming. All right. Um, let me find. Just want to make sure I've got a bunch of questions in here, but there are some of them are repeat askers. So I just want to make sure I've covered. Looks like uh, Catherine Scott, who asks, uh, when do you expect to make the decision about the grade configuration, reconfiguration, who ultimately votes decides on whether that happens? So um, the, our target for that was to try to get that decision made in, in early June. Um, that requires feedback from, from this group. If people feel like um, that's aggressive and that there's more information needed and the, the, um, the executive authorities in town feel they need more information, then we'll have to readdress our calendar. We did have a, a meeting with the Board of Selectmen, the School Committee, and the Warrant Committee, as well as the School Building Committee in early April to start that conversation. Um, we are continue to provide them with data. Ultimately, um, as the school building committee, um, we look to um, the school committee and the district for an educational perspective um, because it's their job to decide um, certain things about um, you know, how, how the schools are run and, and what the preferences are there. And then ultimately the board of selectmen as our executive authority, those are the bodies that need to um, support that decision and um, the the public elect those officials and need to be able to uh, feed that information to those officials. We are doing our best to facilitate your feedback to them. Certainly welcome to discuss and, and um, your concerns with them, um, whether it be in a school committee meeting or a 
Board of Selectmen's meeting. Um, and the survey also will help uh, share your feelings on that topic as well. So um, still kind of fluid and we recognize that uh, these are uncertain times, but we're trying to gather as much feedback as we can from you on that. Uh, let's see. All right, I'm going to go back to uh, Christian Donner, who has another question. Uh, and Christian asks, would it make sense to halt planning and design right now if there is a reasonable concern that construction funding might not be secure to avoid a situation where the work products of the current phases will be outdated and have to be redone? Uh, this is a good question, um, and I think that's where we're looking for some feedback from the town on their, their feelings in regards to that. Um, we ultimately, um, we made a, uh, um, we appropriated a million dollars for this process, the feasibility study process, um, and that was done uh, last year at last year's town meeting. Um, we have the funding to complete this process. Um, but that's where we really want to hear from you about what your thoughts are. Um, we want to be able to make decisions intelligently. We recognize that there's uh, very um, uncertain times um, and we, nobody really knows what the outcome is going to be of this pandemic. We could very well have a vaccine in a couple of months or this could drag on for years. We really don't know. Um, so that's why we're seeking your feedback. That's why the survey will go out. And that'll be an opportunity for you to share with us your thoughts. Obviously, you know, we're, we're concerned with, um, you know, the town being able to support this project. We, we certainly don't want to um, go too far down a line uh, with a project that the town does not support. So, um, you know, please, by all means, share your thoughts with us um, and um, connect with us on, on how you feel we should proceed. All right, I have uh, another question from Paul Narkowicz. Um, Paul asks, um, I don't know if I was the one that you couldn't see. Oh, that's not a, oh, sorry, that was uh, it's actually Marie Martin and she was just clarifying her name. So we'll, we'll move on from that. Um, I have a question from Leo Brem. Leo asks, what could the old Dale be used for if it is not renovated? Um, that's a good question. I know in, in past discussions on that topic, the Parks and Rec uh, was one use. Um, there was also discussion about possibly um, it being given over for senior housing as a, as a renovated building. Um, and that could be done through RFP and, and some other process. Um, these are all just things that I've heard. I, I have not explored any of those options in any depth. Um, but, um, and I think you know, we'd, and, and the town in general would be open to ideas if anybody had them. Another question from Elizabeth Marset. She asked if Memorial were to become an early childhood center housing pre-K and kindergarten, how much in the, oh wait, sorry, we already answered that, right? An additional tuition minus additional staff would MPS make? You answered that right, Jeff? I did. Sorry about that. Okay, I have a question from uh, Stephen Resch. Um, Stephen asks, roughly how much does a $10 million bond worth of bond for a school building cost and property tax per thousand of property value and for how many years? When we discuss these large construction costs, it might be useful to help residents translate those costs to what the burden would be for their own households. Uh, excellent question. I'm not surprised in the least. We've done some investigation. Um, I'm, I don't have numbers boiled down into 10 million versus X. What I have boiled down to is I've asked uh, for uh, preliminary debt schedules to be pulled together based on a couple of uh, options. And I gave a range. Obviously, we're dealing with wide ranges for projects and um, the difference between the four five and the three four five. The range that um, that uh, I gave them was 50 to 75 million dollars in borrowing. And what that is is an estimate of the overall project cost that you saw previously, minus 
what the what my estimate is for the MSBA's reimbursement. Obviously, this is all very fluid. But I wanted to be able to give you that range because we need to be frank with everybody about what the impact is. The overall impact is approximately an eight to ten, eight to twelve percent increase in um, in each taxpayer, uh, depending on the overall borrowing rate. Bond issue uh, is often very uh, very much driven by the interest rate, right? Because you'll be paying that over the span of twenty years. Um, to answer your other question, this is a twenty-year borrowing. So, with a fifty to seventy-five million dollar bond issue, fifty or seventy-five. And given a uh, what the current interest rate environment is, which um, I, I don't anticipate changing much drastically, if anything, maybe going lower, given the economic environment, um, the estimate for a median household, which is six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in Medfield, would be somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars per year, um, and that goes down over time as the principal gets paid off each year. Um, so over the 20 years, it eventually tapers off. So um, that gives you a frame of reference. I know those are big numbers, so um, I want to make sure we're clear on that. And they are, it is a wide range right now as we're still pretty early in the process. So um, we're certainly working to keep those numbers as low as possible. Um, but it does give you a frame of reference of, of the size of this project, even the smaller project. Uh, this is a significant project. Um, what I can tell you is that um, as of this year, we will be at one of the lowest debt levels that we've been at in Medfield since uh, the last major school project, uh, which was uh, since the last major capital project, which was the DPW, um, which would um, it, it's one of the um, one of the lowest levels that we've had since since then. So we've been able to pay off um, significant amounts of, of debt, and as as noted, the previous major school project from the early 2000s um, is still coming off, which is helping to see those uh, steep declines. So um, that'll all be, we'll, help, we'll have lots of information about that. Um, I have fancy charts that I'm pulling together that I hope to distribute to the general public as soon as I, I tidy up the numbers a bit. Um, so it does give you a sense of, of where, where we stand. The um, Permanent Building Committee, which I also chair, um, we always try to make uh, strategic decisions about when these projects are approved and um, timing wise. Um, so what I can tell you is that since we're not right back on top of a previous capital project, um, we are at one of the, we will be at one of the lowest um, overall debt levels in, in the coming years. Um, but we'll also be having to take on more debt on a single project than this town ever has. So um, definitely uh, important question. Um, I do want to make sure that people understand what the impact is to their individual homes. Um, obviously, the, the more expensive your home, the bigger share you'll have of the overall tax impact. I hope I shed some light on that. I have a question from Jill Rafter. She says, has there been any consideration for expanding before and after school programs for each of the proposed configurations and schools? starting in earliest grade configuration. I'll leave that to you, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. I think we we have our own uh, homegrown one that we do with before and after, and also we have uh, the, the great relationship with MAP. So I think we're definitely considering that as part of um, all three buildings and whatever configuration we come to, we'll make sure that we have a program for both uh, before and after school. Maybe almost 90% don't utilize that structure. Oops. I can answer that, Mike. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, that's one way of looking at it. I say most districts utilize a K to two, K to four, K to five, one to five, um, usually the neighborhood schools. So, you know, Medfield is unique in the sense that we have all of our kids go through all of our elementary schools. And other than Holliston and, and Hockington, there aren't many districts that that use that model. So that's why you could make that assumption that 90% don't utilize it. Thanks, Jeff. A question from Holly Rand. 
Uh, has MAP been involved in the planning to support a three grade configuration? Uh, yeah, as I said before, I, I think we've involved them in the, in the process um, early on and to let them know they were, they were gonna be a part of our project. So uh, whether it's a two grade configuration or a three grade configuration, they're a part of that. All right, um, I have a question from um, Michael Liu. Uh, the cost estimate slide was identified as being out of date. Which of the cost options listed on that slide are no longer under consideration? Um, so uh, I will sort of clarify that statement. So um, the last school building committee meeting, we started to narrow down the options. Um, we have not done any uh, further cost estimating. So uh, we will update that, but if you want to use that as a range, I, I don't think that, you know, we can, we can certainly do that. Um, I don't think that uh, they're going to change too drastically. It's going to be a little bit less as we move forward, as we've, what we've been able to do is work with Arrow Street to start to skinny up the program and uh, square footage. And as we work through that and start to better define some of the spaces that we'll be putting in the building, um, we're starting to bring down the square footage numbers. Um, so it's an ongoing process. Um, and um, through this phase, we will be getting more detailed cost estimating. Um, since we've narrowed down those options, we'll be able to focus in more detail and get more detailed cost estimates as well, as opposed to them just being conceptual. Um, so stay tuned on that, a lot more information to come. I have a question from Kathy Kumar. How will the funds be raised for the town's portion of the cost of 10 to 15 million? Will it be from property taxes or other mechanisms of funding? All right, so uh, it, it is through property taxes. Um, I will say when you say the town's portion of the 10 to 15 million, um, that I'm assuming you're, you're referring to the difference between the four five and the three four five, as I noted, the overall borrowing for the town is likely to be between 50 and 75 million, um, depending on some of the decisions that we make over the coming months um, before we put it in front of the town. A question from Sarah Becker. How will the community survey fielded May 20th to 27th be distributed? Given that many residents are not on social media, will there be paper-based option? dropped in all residents' mailboxes to ensure full community engagement. Given this impact, all citizens believe paper-based service should be an option. Um, Anna May, do you wanna handle this one? Yes, hi there. So we are going to distribute um, the surveys via email and um, that is a valid point for paper. So I can, um, We'll discuss that with uh, Lynn Stapleton and um, Dr. Marsden. Maybe we can figure out a way to get these two residents who want it um, by a paper. I've been in contact with Roberta Lynch as well, and um, perhaps um, that population would want paper. So I'll reach out also to, to Roberta for that as well. So, um, Anna May, if also, I just want to make sure you're, you're clear on all of, it's not just going out through social media, that um, it'll be through email lists, through contact with uh, New in Town. Yeah, so we do. We've um, identified our, um, our community partners, so beyond the schools. Um, we've reached out to the preschools in town who are not yet, some of those families are not yet in our schools and also um, our community partners such as Council on Aging, New in Town, Memo has been great in getting the word out as well. So we are spreading our, our tentacles around trying to get as many folks um, to answer as possible. Okay, uh, next question I have is from Jerry Potts. Jerry asks, I worry that each time the debt we incur on previous projects rolls off, we actually take on even larger projects and taxes keep increasing. I've always supported the schools and supported at Dale Street, but with the high performance of our district with the existing configuration, I'm having a hard time supporting a larger, more offensive project, knowing we have other critical capital projects in the near future as well. How much do these other projects, park and rec, building, water treatment factor, 
sorry, water treatment factor into this planning process. So um, I'll uh, I'll chime in a little bit, but um, Jeff, you may have for, to further expound on this. But um, so I could tell you that right now there's um, we haven't factored in a, a park and rec building. I don't know that um, you know that um, it's been on the radar. It's certainly on our radar. Uh, I don't know where the community stands with that uh, in terms of the timing of that. I think the uh, the community has has supported them and the feasibility study was ongoing with them um, on a very uh, basic level. Um, but certainly that would that would factor into our overall planning and should factor into a decision on this. There's no doubt about that. In terms of the water treatment plant, that's a little different because that is funded through the enterprise fund as, as, as the way I understand that. So I'm not an expert. Um, I believe that's what um, the information I've gotten from the town on that. So it's not exactly a the same in terms of how that is funded. Um, but all major capital projects um, always factor into this. But given uh, the size of this project, obviously it's a unique situation. And um, um, yes, you're right. Every 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 one of these projects gets more expensive as time rolls along. Um, and and prices don't go backwards, uh, especially in construction. I can tell you that much. Um, now, obviously, they cycle to and fro as the econ as the economy does. Um, with the public safety building and the DPW, we happened to get uh, good timing where the economy was a little soft, and actually we got uh, very good deals on from a cost per square foot uh, uh, ratio. Um, so that actually helped us in terms of the overall borrowing. But um, you, you're right; it, we these tend to run in as as you'll you'll see in some of the charts I'm putting together in these 20 to 30 year cycles, because um, you know towns accomplish one project and they've taken on as much debt as they can. They need to start to wind it down. They take on another project. Um, we haven't done a major school project in just about 20 years. Uh, and that one was was the most significant at that time that the town had ever um, had ever accomplished. Um, so these are all good questions, um, Jeff. I don't know if you want to chime in a little anymore from uh, from the school's perspective. Uh, nothing to add, Mike. Okay. All right. I have a question from Tom Powers, who asks: uh, seventy-five million by approximately. 1,500 homes is about 50,000 per home in debt. How is that sustainable in a potential economic recession? Um, I don't know where you're getting 1,500 homes. Um, there are uh, about approximately 4,500 homes uh, in, uh, in Medfield. So I don't know exactly um, how you're factoring that. And, and keep in mind, again, it's, uh, it's based on a 20 year borrowing. So, um, you know, it's overall, it's, those town, those homes turn over over time. Some people stay 10 years, some people stay 40 years. Um, so the exact per household overall payment over the length of the bond is, is tough to calculate. But just to correct your numbers, there are approximately 4,500 households current or planned um, in, um, in Medfield. And that does not include any development at the hospital. Okay, uh, I have a question. I have a question from Sarah Raposa. Um, Sarah says, hi Mike, not new school related, but relevant to the Dale Street site reuse discussion from earlier. But here's a plug for the townwide master planning committee's virtual public forum on Sunday, June 7th at 5 p.m. And part of that discussion relates to capital facilities and public services. Um, great. That's uh, great to know, Sarah. Thank you for sharing that. I hope everyone here uh, pays as much attention to the townwide master planning committee as they have uh, to us tonight. Um, those are equally important decisions. Um, so once again, the townwide master planning committee will be doing a virtual public forum on Sunday, June 5th at 5 p.m. Um, and uh, the topic of Dale Street's reuse may come up at that meeting. All right. I have a question from Robert Winograd. Robert asks, what is the condition of the Wheelock School? Once Dale's uh, construction is over, would Wheelock need priority? Um, I can tell you from, from my perspective, uh, 
in, in the grand scheme of things, Wheelock would be the next school to be renovated or replaced. Um, but I don't anticipate that that would be um, within the next uh, 10 to 20 years, given the, um, the cycle of uh, the MSBA process. They need to make sure that their, their funding gets to all communities. Um, so jumping back in with another project would not be something that they would respond to kindly. Um, I can tell you that it's functioning just fine, far better than Dale Street is. Um, um, and Jeff, I don't know if you want to clarify any, any, um, anything else on Wheelock. I would also add, uh, Jeff, I think we just did a boiler project over there not that long ago. That, that's what I was going to say, Mike. Yeah, so we just did MSBA boiler replacement project uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, so it's got a lot of life left in it. Thanks. All right. Um, so I'm jumping back to a couple of duplicates, bear with me. All right, I have uh, another question from Bob Herbzuber, apparently clarifying that he was uh, asking about um, the conservation land behind uh, Wheelock, not necessarily the fields. And um, so just to clarify that, again, there's no, there's no plan to restrict the public's access to the conservation land behind there. Um, this project would not be touching that land. It is uh, in conservation on the other side of the, the tracks, on the other side of the railroad tracks. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. All right. Um, we have another question from Christian Donner who asks, uh, one big cost driver for ongoing budget needs of the public safety building was hiring. Are salaries for new teachers that will be needed to staff the empty classrooms included in operation cost projections? So yeah, we've done some preliminary uh, cost projections um, looking at what staffing might be needed. We have to do that as far as M MSBA process. But again, a lot of unknowns there. So it's, it's not really an exact science on what the existing or what the potential cost could be for teacher salaries, staffing, et cetera. But we've done some preliminary work on that. I think the question too is, Mike, is that included in the, the project projections that you share? And that the answer to that is no. No, that's correct. That is no. Um, I think as, as, as we discussed with Jeff in the past, the, the intention is, is not to have empty classrooms and or to um, hire people for the sake of, of filling a classroom such that we end up with extremely low student to teacher ratios of you know 10 or 12 just because there is some, some growth built into the building um, so um, and I think Jeff you uh, you would agree with that statement absolutely I think we're just we're going to hire for what we need and we're going to um, keep close to the school committee policy around class size and and um, develop grade levels around that. Yes. All right, so uh, I have uh, another question from Chris McHugh. Um, she asks, actually, she wanna combine this a little bit. Um, there's a couple questions here, but I do wanna address them. Is there no public forum planned after traffic parking studies and environmental studies have been conducted? How are we conducting traffic studies with no schools in session? And what about all the unique uh, Wheelock specific permitting required? So first on that, um, there uh, will be uh, other public forums once we have all that data, that data is being collected. Um, it'll be certainly discussed in all of our school building committees meetings. I encourage all to attend those as well. Um, if we can get even half of the attendance we got tonight, that would be a new record as well. Um, and then um, in terms of how are we conducting traffic studies with no schools in session, the fact is we cannot. So what we're doing is our traffic engineer is developing uh, models based on um, similar schools and districts and looking at our, our ratio of uh, children that are bust versus children that are driven to school. Um, so there's some analysis being performed there. Um, we recognize that it's not perfect, that it is analysis and we won't have actual data on that. Um, so it remains to be seen sort of where we take that. Um, but we're um, in the process of uh, that. We haven't received anything. But I don't know, Larry, if uh, Niche has had any updates to you. Um, no, Mike, as you're saying, we're in the process of doing that and we are trying to um, 
really be thoughtful about how we can do this um, with the current condition where really there is hardly any traffic at all. Um, and we're looking at previous studies that may have been done with related to the public safety building. Um, we're trying to build on other information that the police or fire departments have. Um, we're trying to understand um, previous traffic and then project out what new traffic might be. So while it won't be quite as robust as we might otherwise be able to do, it um, will, will uh, we think, give a reasonable approximation of the situation. Um, and then as soon as um, life returns to normal, so to speak, um, we're happy to send out the traffic engineers to continue on those efforts. So, and again, to address the question regarding quote unquote wheel lock specific permitting, um, I'm assuming that Chris, you're referring as you have in the past to um, the uh, water protection districts that uh, exist there. Um, just to clarify for everyone, both sites, I repeat, both sites are in aquifer protection districts. Um, this is uh, normal. Um, Wheelock, in addition, is in what's called a well protection district. Um, and further down Wheelock, way down, there is a wellhead. And that wellhead has its own wellhead protection district, which is um, a couple hundred feet. Um, so the process of this is what, what those districts, what that district means is that um, whenever there's a construction project within that district, we need to make sure that we go through the permitting process that uh, requires to prove out that we will not adversely affect the uh, water supply. Um, I can tell you that we've built many projects in aquifer protection district, including very recently in Hopkinton uh, with the Marathon School. Um, this is quite common. Um, if we were building a tannery or a dry cleaner, or if we were, um, you know, working on uh, fleet vehicles uh, and there was, and we were storing large chemicals on site, this would be something that would become a problem for us. I can tell you that also that whatever, pro whatever this building project is on either site will be an improvement. Um, in its protection of the water resources and what exists on those sites today. Both those sites have schools on them currently and um, have systems that are uh, much older and nowhere near the level of um, oversight that, uh, that goes into projects today. So I can tell you that we will be following all the necessary permitting processes that we need to, regardless of the site that is selected and that there will be no risk uh, to uh, water resources from this project. All right, uh, question from Elizabeth Marset. If Memorial were to become an early childhood center housing pre-K and K, wait, why is that said popping up again? I think we answered that, right? <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Um, Kevin Stoddard asks, has the co cost to decommission Dale Street been factored into the cost of replacing it with a new site? Uh, if not, what is the cost to decommission Dale? Uh, the real question is what, what condition do we leave in at Dale if we do uh, leave it? Um, we are exploring the possibility of a partial demo if uh, we choose the Dale Street site to build a new school. Um, I think there's, there's some desire, there seems to be some desire I've heard from a few town residents to save the Dale Street School, even if it's not used as a school. Um, so, you know, that would need to be factored in. If, if we do choose to um, demolish the school, it would, it, the cost of that would either, would depend on whether we're building a new school on its existing site, in which case the MSBA would participate in those costs. Or if we're building on Wheelock's site, the MSBA would not participate in the uh, demolition. Um, and then the, the cost to change it into some other future use and renovate it for that use is, we would need to understand what that use would be in the future. Um, and we don't have that um, direction right now. Um, so uh, another question from uh, Christian Donner. Uh, Mike, I'll ask my last question again a little differently because it is important to me. 
our increases in staffing levels for the various configurations incorporated into projections and future tax increases. Jeff, do you want to address that just on the staffing levels? Yeah, I think we, we talked about that before that we've We've done some preliminary um, projections on that, um, and we've, we've looked to see what we need, but, you know, certainly costs aren't exact. Uh, so, the, and again, those aren't factored in the, the, the cost that you had shared, Mike, earlier. Okay. Um, I hope that helps, Christian. If not, I think um, we can talk more. Right, uh, just sort of scanning through. Um, I have another question from Steve Paskey. With so many tentacles of ideas, have the teachers been polled to see what their preference is? Yeah. Yes, elementary teachers were polled in January. And, you know, we, we've done it, we said this at other um, open forums, a lot of positive feedback about um, moving to a three, four, five. But certainly, there's some concern for um, some memorial teachers that have been there for a long time moving from uh, memorial to Wheelock. That's only natural. Okay, I have a qu another question from uh, Bob Herbzuber. Are there any funding differences from MSBA whether or not we change grade configuration? In terms of um, percentages, no. Um, the MSBA has allowed us to explore these two different configurations um, based off of um, the educational plans that have been submitted for each configuration. Um, and so it's only proportional to the size of the project. Um, no, basically their, um, their funding differences would not change whether we chose to go four or five or three to five. Another question from Michael Liu. Can a three to five grade configuration be supported at either potential building site? Um, so I'll, I'll answer some of that, and Jeff, uh, you can add on to that from your perspective. Um, in my opinion, yes. Um, the um, three to five grade configuration can be supported on either site. Um, certainly, the Wheelock site has more space. Dale Street is, is a little bit tighter and would definitely be denser. Um, certainly in the larger configuration, it would be um, a lot of kids for, um, for that site, um, though it is um, downtown, so it does have um, the ability to be a little bit more denser, um, though it is adjacent to a neighborhood. And we are uh, working with the design team to show the impacts on um, what a building of this size would look like in that district, uh, because, you know, there's some neighbors that are right up adjacent to that site pretty tightly that live in one and two story uh, homes. So we wanna make sure that they understand what, what the potential is there. Um, with Wheelock uh, and the ability to tuck it behind the existing Wheelock building, there's very few neighbors that would uh, have any direct impact by the overall size of it. In terms of um, can we fit um, either site with that? The answer is yes. Uh, I think that either site could accommodate this many students, including the growth that's built in. Um, and I can tell you that from working with other districts, there are plenty of schools that are far denser, um, densely, far more densely populated than what we're projecting for either of these sites. So um, Jeff, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I would agree, Mike. They can definitely uh, fit at, at both sites. Uh, but to the reasons you stated, I think it's um, a building of that size at, at Dale Street could be problematic for neighbors. And certainly taking away all that field space in between, if, if we ended up doing that new construction right in the middle, um, that could be, it's a very different sight line for those neighbors at Adam Street than they're used to. Um, they're used to seeing uh, an open field and then they'd see a building. Uh, if we went through that configuration, certainly um, less of an impact if it was built behind Wheelock. Thanks, Chad. All right, I have a, a qu another question from Stephen Resch. Um, Stephen asks, it sounds like we have to decide on grade configuration with current cost estimates. It seems clear that a three grade school offers several advantages in terms of enabling a better educational product and more flexibility for the future. But for residents that have concerns about financial impact and perhaps doesn't place a high priority on incremental improvement in the quality of Medfield educational programs, can you make a case that spending the incremental 11 to 15 million one by Medfield residents on the three grade version 
of New Dale Street School has the potential or the likelihood to save money or be particularly partially, excuse me, partially offset in the medium to long run or have some non-educational benefits, either by our school system operating costs for future school capital projects, uh, property value impact, current bond financing terms, et cetera. Um, so um, I'll, I'll add a little bit here and then Jeff, I think uh, you can chime in as well. Um, I could tell you, uh, I won't touch on the, the educational benefits. I'll leave that to, to Jeff. I know from a strategic perspective, I've had conversations with um, Mike Marcucci from the, bill, uh, from the Board of Selectmen. Um, and um, he's always talked about uh, the potential to eventually go to uh, two elementary schools where you would have an upper and a lower elementary, sort of a pre-K to um, two and then a three to five. Um, and I don't know if that would be ever uh, viable or not, but um, if that were to occur, we would need to do a three grade school now. If we choose to do a two grade school now, we're basically committing to our three elementary school model for the foreseeable future. Um, a three grade school now allows us to potentially consolidate further in the future if the town so decides when the Wheelock building starts to reach the end of its useful life. Um, and then, and then there'd be further discussion about how that gets done um, at that time. in the in the you know two decades from now uh, time span. Um, who knows what the uh, changes will occur to this town by then? Um, so I think that there's a potential for um, consolidation in in schools, which um, is a way to save operating costs. And then um, the other way to save is um, in terms of being able to um, commit to larger construction now when bond financing is low is uh, certainly a good idea. Uh, it's something that um, you know, we try to factor in. We obviously don't wanna do it when bond financing is high. That's when you know, it costs, uh, the bond financing terms are often far more of an impact on the overall cost of the project than people factor in. They just look at the initial price tag. Um, so being able to bite off sort of as much as we can now is certainly something to consider um, under the notion that, you know, we're in very challenging economic times. So it's not always an easy decision. Matter of fact, usually in challenging economic times, that's when it's the most difficult to make these kinds of commitments. Um, Jeff, do you have anything to add on the case to spend the additional 11 to 15 million for the extra grade? No, I think uh, in the presentation we highlighted, you know, some of the advantages of why we think a three, four, five is educationally better. It, it feels like Steve agrees to that based on his question. So, um, you know, I think it's it's a better model long term for what we what we need for in the district in terms of education, but not only uh, not only that, but um, supporting the enrollment that is bound to happen in this district. So we, you know, we get all this data and we have to trust the data in terms of enrollment. Um, but there's one thing that's been very clear since I've been here, and every year we get the, the NESDEC uh, information, and they tell us, and, and actually MSBA told us the exact same thing, that Medfield has the highest kindergarten, uh, birth to kindergarten ratio they've ever seen. So what that means is that more people move to Medfield after their children are born than, uh, than any other community that they've seen. The only one that rivals that is Sudbury, and then sometimes in cer certain years, Hoppington. But I think you know, that's the hardest thing to project is when you have folks coming in and they stay in the, in the community and you get them at, at kindergarten, it's much easier to project, you know, where we're going to be four or five, six years down the road. But when we have so many people that move in after their children are born, that's a really hard uh, data point to really nail down. So um, having the three, four, five uh, gives us that space that we need educationally. And um, certainly I, I know it's a, it's a huge cost and a huge ask. And, and I know this is you know, we're mindful of the fact that, you know, we're, we're trying to do a lot of work around remote learning right now and plan for a safe opening in the fall. We, we, we recognize that. And there's so much uncertainty with the economic um, situation, both at the federal and local level. We get it. Um, but we think, you know, we started this process years ago, 2018, um, and well before a pandemic could even be thought of. So, um, we, get, we understand what's going on in the community right now and some of the trepidation based on some of the numbers that we shared, but we still believe um, educationally the three, four, five is, is a better way to go. Thanks, Jeff. Um, 
All right, I, uh, I have a question from uh, Tom Powers who asked, does your figure of 4,500 households include rental units? Homeowners are bearing the increased burden of increased taxation. You seem to fa favor Dale of Butter's sight lines over Wheelock of Butter's sight lines. Why is that? Um, I am not favoring any anybody's sight lines over anyone else's. What I can tell you is that um, the sight lines uh, from adjacent homes to the project are far longer at Wheelock than they are at Dale. And we're gonna have some graphics that help to show that. Um, you know, and we'll let you decide for yourselves. By all means, um, we're putting that that together so people can see for themselves what the impacts will be. Um, and uh, it's not for not for me to judge. That's for all of you to judge. In terms of the households, um, there are 4,500 households, and while rental units, um, you know, they don't pay taxes, the owners of those rental units do pay taxes. So, um, rental units are not. Um, excluded from any of that and I can tell you that we don't have 3,000 rental units so 4,500 households is the amount of households that pay taxes um, and that's a round number I recognize so um, those are um, either existing households or planned some of the new ones that are under construction that you see around town um, most notably at Hospital Hill and at um, Dale Street and 27 um, those all will be um, paying taxes, even if they are rental units. All right, I have uh, another question from Jerry Potts, and he says, uh, you may have addressed it. Um, I had a conflict for the first part, but given the current pandemic, many planners are questioning the concept of higher density slash clusters for public buildings. Even if we get a vaccine for COVID, why does the idea of having many more students and teachers in one area make sense given what we know now? Um, so, you know, obviously uh, nobody really knows the impacts of COVID right now. Um, what I can tell you is that we looked at both sites. Um, actually, we looked at more than, we looked at every site in town to see which sites were available for this size of a project. Um, and we chose two sites, both of which have existing schools, both of which would have the same, uh, similar populations, um, regardless of which one we chose. If we you know, put a larger school on Dale Street, we still have Memorial adjacent to it and actually would be closer in proximity than, um, than the Wheelock site, depending on where we actually place the building. Um, so spacing apart, is something that actually Wheelock has an advantage because it's a much larger site and we're able to um, keep students a little bit further apart. Um, that said, we still don't know the exact impacts on public buildings. Nobody really knows that uh, right now. Um, we're still evaluating that. How that's gonna impact school construction in general, it may be as little as nothing or it may it may be extensive. Um, I think right now the, the um, you know, there's a lot of people looking at it, but right now there isn't a plan in um, school design. I don't know, Larry, if you're hearing anything on your end on how school design may change based on um, pandemic issues. Yeah, I, I think uh, many of you are seeing in the popular press, um, we are looking at that closely um, and we've got building projects that are going on now that we're um, trying to understand that. We're also working with some clients on their existing schools. Um, as you all can imagine, it's a um, evolving world. I think in general, the, the new buildings operate uh, much better in that regard. The HVAC systems in particular, which have been um, improving the indoor air quality and the amount of fresh air that's delivered to the classrooms um, the old days of sealing up the windows in September and opening them again in May um, really have gone away. And so that's working to our advantage. Um, I think on the other hand, um, everyone can see the difficulties of remote learning. Um, we're not anticipating that um, schools are really gonna be able to capitalize on remote learning the, the way you might in the, uh, in the work environment where you say, yeah, the uh, Office of the Future might be more of a remote situation. So we're seeing that for the schools and particularly elementary schools, it's gonna be really a, 
very much a, an evolution to understand the impact on the building and the systems, um, but likely you're going to be having the same number of kids in the space. Thanks, Larry. All right, I have uh, another question from Michael Liu. Do you anticipate the MSBA will cover any portion of the three to five grade configuration premium that is identified on the cost estimate slide? Um, so um, again, we we expect the premium to be 16 to 20 million. Um, so um, we're rough estimating that the town's portion of that would be the 11 to 15. Um, so the difference between the two would be what the MSBA would cover. So the answer is yes, the MSBA would cover a portion of that premium if we chose to build the larger project. All right. Um, so uh, let me scroll back up. We've got a bunch of repeats here. Just want to make sure we've got everybody covered. Um, Uh, so uh, Leo Brem asks, has every project we have started been more debt than before? Um, not exactly. Um, depends on the size and the scope of the project. I can tell you that uh, um, the projects that we encountered, you know, 20 or so years ago, um, if it was a similar size project today, it would certainly cost significantly more. We've seen that uh, overall, um, you know, construction costs have been escalating recently at about uh, four to five percent per year. Um, obviously, we don't know what the, what's going to be uh, the impact of COVID on that. They may actually decline for a period of time as we start to uh, see any economic weakness. Um, I can tell you that construction has been a big focus, as you've probably seen in the press with uh, the governor and with um, Governor Cuomo. Um, construction is considered essential, especially school construction, which is why many of our projects uh, continued even throughout this uh, COVID uh, process. Um, and um, we're actually implementing all sorts of new safety guidelines for construction in this, in this new realm that we live in. Um, so, but I can tell you that uh, if you look at a big enough span, probably five years or so, uh, prices are always going to be going up. They are certainly not going to be going down when it comes to construction. Um, this, certainly this, this neck of the woods in uh, greater Boston and Massachusetts is a very hot construction environment and has been for um, certainly my, most of my career, um, which uh, I won't tell you how long is because it's probably been too long. But, um, so yes, uh, on a cost per square foot basis um, for a similar type of project, say schools, it does go up over time. All right. Um, I have a question from Chris Potts. Uh, do we have a written agreement of some kind with MAP that will guarantee it will have sp space? Who will foot the bill of moving the Wheelock MAP modular for school construction purposes if that becomes safe today? Jeff, you want to tackle that? Sure. So we do not have a written agreement with MAP. And you know we're a few years away from construction here, so we haven't had that detailed conversation with MAP at this point. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Bob Herbsuber. Bob asks, what about the train that goes by two to three times a day at Wheelock and has the potential of becoming a commuter rail line in the future with five to 10 trains a day? Um, I mean, I can, I can talk to that too, Mike. So, yep. um, you know, we have the tracks that are right next to the Dale Street site as well. They're fairly close there. Um, so I guess it's, you know, what site we're really talking about because we have trains going by two or three times a day at both sites. So um, it's definitely something that I know that Larry has talked about in design on both sites and looking at uh, how, they, how there's some space. Um, uh, some soundproofing that goes into the new buildings and how to address that, but I know that's an issue at both sites. Yeah, I can, and I can jump in on that. Um, we will be looking at, we have acoustical engineers on our team. Uh, we will be looking at the impact on the proposed either renovation or new construction at Dale, as well as the proposed new construction at Wheelock. Um, and would be taking um, appropriate precautions to construct the buildings in ways to minimize that impact. All right, I have um, 
another question from Leo. I think we may have addressed it. He asked, could the old Dale be used for other town purposes like teen center or rec center? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I don't think we know. Uh, I think we would need to form a, another committee to be able to explore what those options would be. Should we choose to go down that route? Um, and again, we would need to be able to explain to the MSPA that we are exploring that. Um, they want to make sure that any town that chooses to abandon a building as a school um, is at least discussing the future possibilities for that uh, building. Um, there was a question, let me just find it. I want to make sure it gets clear to, out to as many people as possible um, about uh, the email address, uh, Bob Herbstuber asked, please mention the email and how to get questions answered uh, via the email. Um, uh, Lynn or Jeff, do you have that email handy? Or I do. It's okay. Dale, Dale Street School Project at gmail.com. Dale Street School Project at gmail.com. All right, I'm putting that on the Q&A for record, but um, we'll try to distribute that with uh, more depth as well. Um, okay. Um, next question uh, from Chris McHugh. Um, there are actually more environmental risks with trains at Wheelock versus, data, uh, versus Dale based on research related to potential contamination. Um, not exactly sure what that means. Um, so if you want to clarify that question. Um, uh, Chris is also asking who will be the point person for online survey responses, who will be tracking that. Um, the answer will be, uh, it'll be flowing through our owner's project manager left field who will be gathering all that information for us. Um, and it will be available to the public once it is uh, compiled. All right. Um, Bob Herbs, we were asking for clarification on the Wheelock site uh, aquifer and well protection districts. Did, did I hear you correctly that adding those school to the Wheelock site would increase the protection of the aquifer and well district at Wheelock? Last time I checked, adding more people in density has negative effects on the environment. Can you clarify? Sure. Sorry if I. Um, wasn't clear on that. So what I mean is that a new school on either site would be a better um, and um, a better uh, protection against the, the water than the existing schools that exist on them now. Um, basically, as we would be doing, the main concern with water protection uh, for these types of projects, since we are not um, storing large chemicals or any of, of that hazardous stuff, is, is, is come, it comes down to vehicles. So it comes down to stormwater um, and how water sheds from uh, impervious surface, from whether it's pavement or whether it's roof surface. So um, either if, if, let's say we were to build this on Dale Street site, we would be putting in stormwater protections that would make sure that um, any stormwater runoff would be um, treated appropriately um, in, a, in a fashion that would ensure that no pollutants get into the aquifer. And the same holds true at Wheelock. Um, what I can tell you is that with Wheelock, um, I, either options that we're evaluating now would uh, be having us replace uh, large sections of pavement. And what that means is that some of the stormwater plan, the stormwater management plan for that site uh, would improve um, that's not to say that there is no risk, but it would improve because we'd be putting in structures and systems that are better than what exists there on site today. Um, so I, I hope that clarifies it. Um, Larry, I don't know if, um, if you want to touch on any of that from a design perspective. Yeah, no, um, I, I was going to echo your comments. Um, the typical um, site planning we do today, which is all reviewed carefully with the uh, Planning Board and the Conservation Commission um, requires far more extensive stormwater protection measures than what was likely put in 
20 or 30 years, 40 years ago uh, when these buildings were originally built. So typically there is an improvement on stormwater treatment, um, as Mike says, particularly related to um, putting in interceptors and other things to keep any um, miscellaneous oil or gas from vehicle parking areas out of the stormwater system. So holistically, that's going to be an improvement over what is there today. So, and just to follow on that, there's a similar question from Chris McHugh. Why does, why does, why does have a well protection district and aquifer district to begin with? It's not a big deal. Why do towns put them into place? There are no guarantees of no risk. Um, again, the, uh, those, um, those districts are in place for an important reason um, and they require us to build accordingly. And we will be building accordingly such that they permit us in their fashion. They exist to make sure that we do that and to make sure that we're not doing anything that will hinder the, um, uh, the aquifer or the, or the wells uh, that are in the area. So um, those districts are important um, but what they don't do is they do not prevent us from, from putting a project there. All it does is make sure that we're building it appropriately with all the proper protections to ensure that that stormwater runoff is, is appropriately treated on site um, and, and that we uh, make sure that any potential for contaminants do not get into the uh, water supply. I have another question from Leo Brem. Would building a three grade school allow us to only have to renovate, not uh, slash update and not expand Wheelock? Uh, that's a good question, but we're a long way from having the answer to that because one thing a three grade school does allow us to do is it does allow us the freedom to um, absorb growth in the enrollment. And um, Jeff can probably touch on that. Whereas um, building a two grade school, um, we would be absorbing less growth, not that there wouldn't be any, um, but um, if, if, the, if the enrollment projections do play out over time and uh, they're in the, the frame of you know, 20 to 3% or whatever the uh, MSBA numbers are at, keep in mind that we're only building in that growth into a single school. So other schools would then be impacted by that enrollment growth. So um, if that continues, um, we will have either accommodated that for a two grade school or a three grade school and not for the other nine or 10 grades that exist in the school system. So um, that would obviously be impacting uh, future, but that's, uh, that's the, the reasoning why um, there is some benefit to absorbing more growth now, but um, Jeff, do you want to tackle anything else in that regard? And nothing to add there, Mike. You handle it. Thank you. Uh, so let me just scroll back up. Um, I have another question from uh, Kevin Stoddard. Is it possible to build a multi-purpose gym at a new school that could double as a gym for school and new park and rec facility? Um, that's, that's, uh, that's a complicated question, but a good one. Um, certainly, uh, the, the school and park and rec, uh, that are adjacent to each other with Dale street have always, uh, worked well together to, um, you know, assist in, um, utilization of resources. I think the same would hold true here. Um, what I can tell you is that the MSBA probably, uh, wouldn't, really um, be interested in looking at incorporating a park and rec facility with this uh, school. Um, you know, their purpose is education. Um, so the gym itself though, when not in use by the schools, uh, it will be a community resource. It'll be something that as they are today, they're utilized by, you know, youth sports, youth basketball, um, utilized by MAP, um, and so that will be something that gets shared amongst the community. Um, so we would certainly, I think Jeff, um, you can speak to, but I, I think you'd be accommodating of that. 
Um, but in terms of a whole park and rec facility, that um, would be a more complicated question. Yeah, I think that came out during the visioning sessions that uh, folks wanted to make sure there was a community access to the gymnasium because we've heard stories of so many Medfield residents that have to drive to Dedham or Wellesley to, to go to basketball practice because there's just not enough gym space. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we build, whether it's a three, four, five or a four, five, had adequate gym space for the community to use as well. All right, I uh, have a question from Tracy Davignon. Um, excuse me if I butchered my French accent there. Uh, can the reuse of Dale Street be factored into the overall cost so residents know the true cost of whatever plan is chosen? Um, again, we don't know what the reuse of Dale Street would be. Um, and as such, um, it's tough to say what it would cost. Uh, the, because certainly, if, if we do choose to go down the route of, um, of leaving Dale Street in place and, and moving to a new site, um, we would certainly estimate what the um, cost would be to shutter the building uh, until a future use could be made for it. Um, but we would need to study what that future use would be as well before we could understand. And, and whether it may not even be the town, it may be that um, I know some, some people have suggested uh, um, leasing it out uh, for renovation as an RFP to uh, senior housing or some other use. So um, I think there's a lot of questions around that. Um, unfortunately, it, we can't really factor that into this project because um, this project is subject to funding from the MSBA and they won't uh, participate in any of the uh, whatsoever. So I don't have all the answers on that one, but good questions. Uh, I have another question from Christian Donner. It's not a direct question actually, but I urge the committee to work out a financial impact plan for the town and the taxpayers. That includes old debt rolling off, construction costs, other proposed configurations, Dale Street repurposing, best estimates for indirect costs increases such as additional staff salaries, benefits over time, and other drivers for tax increases that are known today with probable best and worst case ranges. I think we need to see the complete financial impact from building a new school versus the status quo without picking and choosing. It will be very difficult to vote on any of the configurations without some level of confidence that we have a handle on the financial future of the town. Um, so uh, excellent statement. We'll certainly be putting a lot of that together. As I've noted, the Dale Street repurposing um, is, is a is a question that we won't have the answers to because um, we just don't know what the repurpose would be. Um, that would be something that the town would need to decide and, and um, it's certainly an unknown. Um, we unfortunately sometimes can't make decisions with every answer. Fortunately, that's one answer. We may not be able to uh, come to a conclusion on before we have to make a decision on this project. Um, all the other things in terms of looking at um, operational costs and looking at old other debt, um, including the initial cost for this project. That's all something we are looking at. Uh, we will be sharing more information on that. Um, and in terms of other drivers for tax increases, I think that information we would need to talk with uh, the warrant committee. That would be something that would have to come from them because I don't have a full picture of what else is out there in the town. I, uh, I uh, unfortunately this this is my second job and uh, um, it's not doesn't give me enough time to uh, be fully familiar with every single financial impact so um, we'll try to get some information from uh, the board of selectmen and from the warrant committee on any future capital costs that may be coming up in the near future that may impact the town and hopefully disseminate that um, to the town but I'm sure a lot of that will come up uh, at our annual town meeting which I think is going to be coming up shortly. Um, so there's certainly, I think, some conversations that can be had there with all of our leadership um, present. All right. Um, uh, another question from Stephen Resch. Is there a date by which we have to make certain decisions or else risk losing ability to access the state's MSBA funding subsidies? Um, so this is kind of a yes and no answer. Uh, 
the we sign an agreement with the MSBA when we enter their process that gives us a timeline of which we need to complete certain decisions and make um, certain um, um, make clear to them what the town prefers and what solution we would like to pursue. That said, the, the, the MSBA is um, being very flexible right now with uh, with given all the COVID implications. And um, we've already applied for a two month extension. Um, they've, they've agreed to extend that to us. I think they would be more than open to um, extending uh, further if they felt that, um, if we felt that that was the right thing to do. I know that some towns are doing that. In particular, um, our client in Wellesley, I believe is, is doing a six, uh, six month uh, delay where they're putting the project on pause. Um, whereas our, our clients in Westwood and Ashland um, are moving forward for more um, and they have communities that support that. Um, so I think that we're really looking for the town to get, give us some feedback on what, what the, the temperature is here. Is this something that we should keep moving forward on? Or should we slow down and, and gather a little bit more information? I think we're, we're open to hearing from everyone. Um, and I want to make sure that's clear is we want to hear from everyone and we'll, we'll do it if we can to reach as many people as possible. Um, it's you know, certainly, a, um, I think uh, it's been great that all of this digital format has allowed so much more participation than we've ever received in the past. Um, so I, I appreciate that we're still even two and a half hours into this that we uh, we still have 50 people here uh, listening to me and on for <laughs> what seems like countless uh, hours. So, um, so I hope that helps, Stephen. Um, and um, let's see what else. All right, I have a question from Mike Donovan. Mike asks, maybe getting ahead of ourselves with this line of thinking, but have philanthropic opportunities been considered as of yet? Campaigns along the lines to reach out to current and former residents of town, addition perhaps naming opportunities for the school or within the school, wing, gymnasium, more commonplace in private schools, but as with any fundraising, you, you can't get funds if you're there. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is no. We haven't explored any of that. I, um, I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, I don't know if, Jeff, if you've had any... any um, um, experience with that or Larry on other projects? So, so when we did we did the turf field, um, we worked with Needham Bank on the naming rights of the scoreboard and got that donated. It was $35,000. Uh, we gave them options of uh, actually naming the turf um, as well. Um, if anyone out there wants to have lights named after them, we need new lights around that turf, so that would be helpful. We're willing to listen. The school committee, I'm sure, is willing to listen to naming rights of new lights, but um, that's the only thing that we've done around here is is um, ask for in the recent years. I know that um, shilling fields are there as well, but um, in the in the recent time, that's the the most we've done. Great idea, though. I agree. Yeah, I was going to say, Mike. Um, we've worked with a couple communities where um, they have tried to do some fundraising. It's usually around the edges, as Jeff is mentioning, uh, whether it's contributing playgrounds or other sort of similar things that people can get behind and raise money. Um, haven't seen it so much in the public sector. Uh, it has happened in some of our more um, private oriented schools. We have had funding uh, around gymnasiums before in the past as well. But bear in mind that any uh, private funds that you receive goes against the um, reimbursement from MSBA. All right, so um, I have a, another question from uh, Chris Potts. She asks, it was shared by our project manager that the two month delay was still within the original timeline and that delay had more to do with the original aggressive timeline when will our SBC discuss pros and cons of requesting four to six months that the MSBA is not allowing? Um, so as I noted previously, we're looking for feedback from the town on whether that is the appropriate course of action. And then we will discuss at our next, next SBC meeting. Um, as, of, as of right now, um, that was not, the original timeline was trying to target a opening of school in 2023. We've since 
push back on that. And um, that was, while it was driven, yes, by uh, an aggressive timeline that was uh, difficult to achieve, um, that occurred because of the pandemic impact, because that was something that was discussed that came out of our quad meeting in early April when we were in the middle of this pandemic. We made the decision to push back our submission date for the PSR by two months. Um, and so now we're asking the community if they feel like um, uh, further, um, further delay is something that they're interested in. So when we have that data back from the town, we will share that with the Board of Selectmen and with the public in general. We will discuss it as a uh, building committee and make a decision. Um, so <laughs> I have a, a note from a question from Kevin Stoddard who says, can you wrap this up with two and a half hours in and I don't like quitting early. So <laughs> I appreciate that you don't like quitting early, uh, Kevin. Um, I do, there's a few more questions. They're all from uh, Chris McHugh. Um, Chris, a lot of the stuff has been touched on, so I'm not going to go back into it. Um, let me just see if there's something that's uh, relevant to um, something we haven't touched on as of yet. Uh, we talked about that. I just wanted to address your statement that says your Compass colleague shared there is a, actually a chance that construction costs could go down as time progresses as building firms fold and others take the place. It's a crapshoot. Um, that's, that's correct. We don't know where uh, construction prices are going to go. I can tell you that uh, many in the industry will say the same thing. Um, there's twofold reason of the impacts uh, on construction prices. Uh, there's materials and labor. So um, the general feel right now is that um, the labor market will soften due to um, some construction projects being shelved. Um, but there's a potential that material costs will increase because uh, of the supply chain uh, slowdown. So um, no one's really sure, and it's way too early. We're only a couple of months into what may take um, at least a year or more to figure out what the impacts will be on construction costs. Um, we're starting to see some projects come, come in for, that are out for bid. Um, right now, pricing has not decreased. We're seeing bids come in right around where they're estimated. So um, the interesting thing will be to watch how that trends and if, if that starts to go up or down um, as we start to bid more projects. But you're right, as of right now, it's a crapshoot. We don't know and uh, we won't know for a little while until we start to see, um, to see that. That won't impact this project per se. Um, and, you know, we're if, if this project does proceed, we're talking about uh, bidding this out um, in um, over, I believe, over a, uh, more than a year from now. Um, so um, construction prices may have stabilized. They may have gone up. They may have gone down. It's really speculation at this point. So um, I have, have to give any solid answer in regards to that. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So um, looks like we've got uh, one new question from um, Hilla Passis. Um, sorry, I had to miss the initial presentation. Could you please talk about the plan for sustainability, energy efficiency, carbon footprint of the planned school building? Um, so we didn't get into a lot of depth on sustainability. Um, we're a ways away from sort of delving into those decisions. Um, as I noted, um, we have had con preliminary conversations with the Medfield Energy Committee, and I believe they're working on an opinion um, and a suggestion, a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen um, in that regard on whether um, I, I believe they're looking to potentially pursue net zero or net zero ready based on some other communities um, that have made that, uh, taken that position, but that would be something that would need to be um, given we would need to be given direction from someone we don't make energy decisions other than um you know making the right life cycle cost uh, decisions on uh, uh, mechanical electrical and plumbing equipment so uh, there will definitely be more information on that coming up um, so thank you for that question all right um so it looks like most of this uh is uh stuff that's been answered or uh is repeat 
Um, so I think we're going to wrap that up for tonight. Um, I appreciate, you have no idea how much it means to have this much participation. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've been through a couple of major capital projects with the DPW and the Public Safety Building as chair of the Permanent Building Committee. Um, and I would have loved to have had even half of this participation on, on some of those meetings. So uh, it, I think it's indicative of the town's concern uh, given the uh, uncertainty of the um, environment right now with COVID and the pandemic and the, the sheer scale of the decision that needs to be made here. So it's not lost on me. I can tell you that it's not lost on the school building committee and um, I won't speak for the school committee. I'll let Anna May do that. So um, I'm gonna pass it to her and see if she has any closing remarks. Um, not, not many, although I am just really grateful at the turnout at, at different points in times, I was writing down the numbers that are still hanging in there. And at this point, we've got still got 55 who stay to the bitter end. So thank you. Um, there is a press release this week regarding the survey. Um, so those who, um, can also find out via the Hometown Weekly and the Medfield Press. And also um, the survey will be up online tomorrow via medfield.net, explore, and then the Dale Street Project. So thank you. And thank you, Mike. You did a great job. Thanks, Anna May. Jeff, any closing remarks? No, I just appreciate the engagement tonight. I know that's something that was our major goal is to get folks in and, and have this conversation, have, ask, have them ask questions and, and get the real story. So I really appreciate it. And again, I'd like to tell you, Mike, great job. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I did just want to note, um, there was a question about what peak attendance was tonight. Um, I've been seeing people come in and out, but I think for, for a large portion of the, um, certainly the presentation and preliminary discussions on the Q&A, uh, we were over 150, um, so that is uh, baffling to me, and, and um, I'm super excited about it. So thank you, everybody, for attending and for your patience. Um, please respond to the survey when you see it come across your bow, and um, participate, participate, participate. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.